Kia ora not in studio today. Run It Straight is going international. Let's go. Yes, kia ora whanau. we're back again, coming from all over the globe. Uh, we've got Willie hiding up in a secret location. I'm not going to say where it is, but I think he's in Whangarei. <laughs> and then we've got Dills and Ephraim hiding in the islands of the beautiful place called Samoa. Welcome, brothers. Oh. Good to see you guys. Malo, malo. What in that? <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I'm just chilling here in Bali somewhere, guys. So that's where I am. What a, what a way to start our show. We're all over the, all over the globe we're here. Yo, um, yeah, we apologise if the signal drops out here and there, but you know, <laughs> some more Wi-Fi isn't that great. <laughs> it's Shut great, uh, great week, great week in the rugby league coming up, guys. Can't wait for this one. <coughs> um, e, what do we got, brother? Sweet. I guess we'll just hop straight into the news, eh, as usual. So first up, we got um, the twenty twenty five Vegas teams have been confirmed. Uh, and those games will be the Raiders versus the Warriors and the Panthers versus the Sharks. How are those for the first set of games? Yeah, I guess for, for me, guys, um, exciting for the Warriors, for, first and foremost. Um, you know, there's been a lot of uh, worst keep secrets, I think, in the NRL, and uh, this was one of them. Uh, the, the teams have been coming out uh, all over the last month or so, and, and everyone has been wanting to know who it is. It's now confirmed the Warriors are heading over to Vegas. Uh, Penrith, Raiders, and Sharks. Uh, you know, for me, I think if it's if it, the exciting match for me would be the Warriors versus the Penrith Panthers, um, and it's a reward for what the Warriors have been able to create over the last year and a half with the the fan base and everyone that's been able to follow the obviously the journey of the Warriors. It's a reward for for them for doing what they've been able to do, and and the NRL have looked after them. Yeah, I like the fact that they're taking four different teams across there and give experiences to some other clubs. We saw how big it was this year and how well it worked. I think it can grow to another level. It's growing to another level already to where there's some conversations being had in the UK where some Super League teams want to take part in it. So whether that grows any legs over the next coming months, we'll have to wait and see, but such was the success of this year's Vegas tournament and the start of the season there. I think it's big, it's huge for the Warriors, and as Blair said, for the fan base, it's huge. I think we'll see, uh, I think with, with the Panthers and the Raiders and the Warriors in particular, with their big Pacific Island numbers that they've got, the Māori Pacific boys they've got, I think they'll draw a big crowd from the Americans to come out and support them. I think that's a a big driving force by have, behind having those teams, but yeah, if it can, if it kicks off and it goes the way it did this year, it's going to be huge again. What do you guys reckon of the reasoning for the Raiders being in? Is because they're playing at the uh, Oakland Raiders or whatever their new name is, Vegas Same. Raiders. Vegas Raiders. That's that's a pretty to me. That sounds like a kind of dumb reason to <laughs> just to have the Raiders. Yeah, well, yeah I, I, I think. Um, yeah, it is a bit of a random reason, but I think that it's more for the game, you know. And I think, like like Willie said, I, you know, I most probably didn't think of that, Willie, when it comes to the Pacific uh, boys that we have in the competition and reaching that kind of an audience over there, especially when the NFL. Um, yeah, the, the Raiders, there is some Māori and Pacifica boys in there, um, but I, I just think, you know, it's great for the game. You know, they would have learned some, uh, got their wrongs from last year, right for this year, or for next year, and be able to create something going forward. So I think um, whatever mistakes they made last, uh, early this year, they'll they'll correct and go again, and it'll be bigger and better, like Willie said. Yeah, I like it. I like the fact that they're trying to marry up the two Raiders teams. I know in the past, uh, the Broncos have gone across. They did it years ago where they went to Denver. The Broncos yeah. and Broncos oh, together yeah. and they built it. If the Canberra Raiders can get anything out of the Vegas Raiders and they can learn something from them and a relationship can be sparked where the man and the power of the NFL can influence a little old rugby league club, it's going to be beneficial to the game as a whole. Sweet as. Moving on, next up is uh, Ronald Griffiths uh, is the new coach for the NRLW Warriors coming in next season. So obviously he was the coach for the Knights in their two premiership wins. So that's pretty exciting. Premiership winning coach. 
Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's exciting, E, because uh, the pathways are now trying to um, grow here in New Zealand. Uh, the, the women's space is moving really quickly, and it's great to have someone of his reputation, his caliber, come from a, a club that's been so strong over the last couple of years. Yes, he's had some really talented players for his, his team, and they've done so well with them. So, uh, but again, you, when you want to come into a competition like this NRLW, you want to come in with a bang, and there's no better way to come in with a, a coach that's done it all before and has uh, championship qualities. Uh, the Warriors are going to be very lucky and it's an opportunity to, to grow the women's space and pathways through New Zealand as as well as obviously jumping on the back of the movement that's already been going in, at the men's space and also the pathways for the kids. Yeah, he's had success, great success with the Knights obviously. He knows and understands, one, the women's game and coaching women, which is very different. So uh, I think that brings its benefits already. The other thing it does is there's so many young girls in New Zealand being attracted to go to Australian clubs right now. So much talent going across. At 15, 16, 17, they're trying to pick them up. To stop that, the Warriors needed to have someone with credentials like Griffiths and to have someone come in and say, we've got a coach that's going to, one, have a successful team, but two, make you better. So I think it's a, it's a real big win for the Warriors signing of his calibre. What do you think, is there much difference between the coaching over in Australia compared to the coaching here in NZ? I suppose you guys might not know too much about the NLW. In the stuff. women's space? Yeah, in the women's space. But there's more teams that have been in the NRLW, so there's more coaches exposed to that yeah. level. And with yeah. the Warriors not having a team for a little while, we're relying on the Fox game. You know, yeah. the part time, they're two days a week. So, yeah, there will be a big, big difference to the talent that you're working with and able to spend time with. Nice. I, I, think, I also think, Willie, I think they, it's come as a full-time role as well. So he's got some big responsibilities through the pathways as well. Uh, and like you said, I guess you're exposed to that high-quality Australian way of coaching. Uh, yes, he's going to have to adapt to some of the, the Kiwi girls because they are obviously coach different. There's much we're going to be a lot more work put into it, especially through the pathway system. Um, again, if you're coming in strong with a good coach, you're going to have to come in strong with uh, some quite high-quality players. And that could be a mix of um, you know Rugby Sevens girls too uh, and NRLW girls so it'll be interesting to see how uh, it all goes uh, be great to see some of these rugby girls jump over but at the same time um, you know coming into this competition with a bang cool. next up roosters have been busy uh, they're starting to get some of their business done so first angus Crichton has resigned after all those dramas with david Fafita, he's uh, signed a two-year extension and then also chad townsend has signed a one-year contract for next season as well How's he going to fit yeah. there? Yeah, great signing for uh, Angus Crichton to be able to say that. His form since, I think, the news about coming to get for feeder has gone to another level. Uh, we've seen what he does in uh, the origin space and how he's been able to create uh, what he's been able to do there, then also bringing that form back to the to the Roosters as well. I think, um, you know, what a great signing that is for the the Sydney Roosters uh, quality player strong carry off the ball um, doing good things at, at origin level hopefully nothing good uh, next week when they play in the origin <laughs> side of, um, Suncorp um, hopefully, has, hopefully has a bad game there but um, an awesome signing I think he's been really uh, good since since the time of his mention that he could be going to rugby obviously that's all fallen through uh, and now he's been able to focus on his rugby league and he's got a reward for it Town, Chad Townsend's a bit of a um, yeah, different one for me. I think, um, again, they're losing Luke Carey over to, to, to the Super League and they bring in uh, an experienced player, which I like. Uh, the experience is mostly what they need to help and guide that that team around the park. Um, he's a quality player. He's done some good things for at the Cowboys. He's been able to lead them around the field and I'm guessing they're looking for someone similar to him. I don't know if he actually gets a start in the team because I think they've got some quality halves down there already. But I guess it's back up just in case. Um, yeah, it's it's one year contract. Um, I'm sure he'll be able to um, help that team and the Roosters team, especially with the way how they're going now. Uh, head head towards the, the top end of the table coming moving forward in the, in the years to come. Yeah, he's an important one, Angus Crichton. And they chased Fafita and missed, missed out on him. Tupanua's gone to the dogs now, so he'll step up 
And as Blairy said, once all that conversation started happening around Fafida and he was close to being out the door, the upturn in his form has been ridiculous. He's gone from struggling to get into the side and finding form to being probably the form back rower in the comp right now. So, yeah, he deserves his, his contract. Good timing to find some form when you're negotiating again. So, uh, yeah, I think he's a good one. He understands the system. They're losing some seniority, as Blairy said, and Kiri. They're losing Jared Wairua Hargraves as well. So they need some of those players to be around for a little while. They tried to chase, or the rumour was they spoke to Sean Johnson earlier in the season to try and, try and get him in. They've gone for another experienced older halfback. I think he wants someone that's going to try and help Sam Walker grow even more in the, in the halves and find him a partner that's a little bit older. It's a little bit like uh, the Panthers did when Nathan Cleary was coming through and they had James Maloney. Just an older head to take care of him while he's learning how to run the team. So mm-hmm. I, th- I think he's a good he's a good pickup just for the year. I think uh, yeah. he would have had a conversation with Trent Robinson about what Robbo's after out of him as far as being that leader and just guide the team around. So um, I, I think that'll be a good move if that's the case. And going on on top of that, uh, there's obviously as well the news of Carter Gordon and Mark Noangani Tawase both have been released from Rugby Union. So they're now free to join the team. Uh, Noangani Tawase, he's not going to be over with the Roosters until after the Olympics because he's playing for the Australian Sevens team. But Carter Gordon, he is now training with the Titans and making his way up into their top 30, hopefully for him. Yeah, there was a there was a bit of stuff in the the media about these these two boys coming back, especially the Carter Gordon one being able to uh, start training now and then and maybe an opportunity to you know if they need chuck them in there and, and give them some game time. Um, but it's again we're we're creating opportunities for other athletes to be able to come over to the game. Um, both I think quality athletes both represent at the highest level when it comes to the, the Australian team and. Um, it's great. I think you know the Bruce's are gonna. Add, he's gonna add some value to the Bruce's, and I also think Carter Gordon's gonna add value to the Gold Coast Titans. So exciting news for the Titans. Exciting news for these rugby union players because now they get an opportunity to uh, express themselves and, and back themselves in a game that they must be a little bit unfamiliar with. Yeah, I like the fact that they're uh, they're branching out and they're looking further afield for talent. Um, there's no doubt. They've got some talent that fits our game in Rugby Sevens, and hopefully Carter Gordon proves that, you know, went from rugby to the Gold Coast Titans. There's a lot to learn. He'll, uh, just to be around training and being around some of the athletes in the side and picking up what he can from Des Hasler, I think he'll have, he's got a lot to soak in and a lot to learn before they chuck him in. And, you know, there'll be some, some hiccups along the way. He, that's as long as they're happy to let them learn that way, then good on them. Uh, I'm, I'm sure they'll both be great acquisitions for their sides. The crazy thing about Nunga Tawasi is, and they said it when they did his release, he could win a gold medal and then come back and win a, mm. an NRL the same year and win a ring. So, yeah, that, that'd be crazy if he came back and was able to do that. But obviously, he's got some talent, he's got some speed. They're losing. Um, Joey Manu and Joseph Swali'i, so there may be a chance for him to slip into the outside backs next year. Yeah, hard. Uh, next up, Daniel Saifidi is leaving the Knights, apparently. Um, so they've told him he can explore his options with other clubs. And because they're on a tight budget, it seems, it's coming out that the Knights just don't have the money to afford guys like him because he's on 800000 a year. Uh, the St. George Dragons have reportedly become the favourite to sign him. Do you reckon he'd fit over there? Yeah, definitely. I think would be a great signing for the Dragons. I think Dragons are trying to build something there. Obviously, after after off the back of you know keeping Ben Hunt still there uh, and, and the boys coming, Damien Cook coming from the middle of the park, so. To strengthen their pack, they're adding some experience and some older guys that can get a job done and help guide. I think 
few of their team, there's a few younger guys, especially the outside backs, that these guys can actually help and, and get them uh, being confident in their ability. So I think that's the, the, must be the biggest reason for some of these signings to uh, St George. Uh, when, I guess we all know, Peter Sullivan's gone into the Newcastle Knights, I think he's signed up there. And when Peter goes to places, people that are on big money normally kind of puts them on, on notice and, and lets them know that they're not going to be wanted um, at the club. Uh, that's what he's he's known for and, and building rosters and, and bringing in players and getting rid of players. So I, I think it would be great for the, the St. George Illawarra Dragons to pick up someone of his capability and his ability uh, would add some leadership qualities to that pack for sure. Yeah, definitely. And it's crazy. This is one of the craziest things about the NRL is managing the cap and managing your ability to fit everyone and all your talent under the cap. And you know, when, you're, when you're back-ending contracts to give people big end of contracts, you're gambling to gamble. You know, he was a state of origin player not so long ago. Is he living up to that level? Not quite right now. I think Leo Thompson's probably their best front row that they've got at this moment in time. So you know, I'll go back to what I said a couple of weeks ago. Clubs want value for money. And they're not quite getting that. So they've got to move him on. And Hetherington sounds like he's going to be moving on as well. They've given him uh, permission to talk and, and look for a job elsewhere. So, yeah, they're trying to free some space up. But the knock-on effect of this, you're talking about St. George, is some of those clubs that we're talking to, Stefano Utokomanu, they're shifting their attention now to Saifiti. So do we see Stefano stay at the Tigers because of this happening, the knock-on effect is uh, ridiculous. Oh, this is rugby league, eh, Willie? It's, it's a funny game. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, you know, one one player moves here, the other moves around. If you don't take up, uh, if you don't say yes to somewhere, another player will take your spot. And the game moves really quickly and it's um, it, it's ever-evolving in everything you do, especially in negotiations. I even think they said Braley might be up for, they, they want to release him too because he's on big money and they've got Phoenix Crossland there that who who last year I thought was a standout for those guys. And I think he was nearly close to playing for the New Zealand team until he got a, a shoulder injury. So um, there's some quality players through their, through their club and some players are on big money. This is how the game works and they just get a little bit of a tap on the shoulder. And um, again, challenging the salary, uh, managing the, the salary cap is the hardest thing to do. And they bring someone like Peter Sullivan in who pretty much just puts a broom through there and just puts people on notice. Without, about? without, without putting his uh, name on out in the public, so everyone knows it's him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next up is Brad Arthur. He has signed on to coach for Leeds. Uh, it's only a fourteen-week contract, though, because apparently well, he wants to come back. That's the story I'm hearing, and that's what people are putting out in the press. But Leeds came out in the press conference yesterday and said they haven't made a decision yet. So I'm not sure where the story is. But, yeah, I, I was. I read the story as well. I read that story until I watched Leeds' press conference and their, their football manager, I think his title is, Ian Blees, um, unusually sat in the post-match press conference with the coach to give his point of view on and give the update on where they are with their coaching appointment, um, said a decision will be made next week. So... Yeah, I, I heard a couple of days ago that Brad Arthur had the job till the end of the season, taken over from Chef Walker, who's the interim at the moment. But I'd, it'd be cra- I'd, I'd find it very strange if that's the case, that they're only getting him to the end of the year and not further on. You get someone of his talent and his experience at Leeds, I'd be tying him down to three years. The rumour is, if, the, if it is the case that they're doing what you're talking about, and it's true that he's there till the end of the year. I think they're looking at the Salford coach, Paul Rowley, looking at taking him on a, as he's been the word around town for a little while since it all went. The football manager that I'm talking about, Ian Blees, he was the chief exec at Salford, where Paul Rowley is. So people are trying to marry things like that. Their relationship, he's got to get roles over. But yeah, I... I if, Brad Arthur's there and you're talking to him and you sign him up for 14 weeks, you might as well go for three years. Mm. Yeah, well, that's, that's the thing. Eh? Is it, I don't think anyone's coming over to the UK for 14 weeks and then going back to coming back to Australia. So 
he would be, I think he'd be enormous really to go over to the UK. I think from his record and what he's been able to do, the, cu- the cu- kind of coach he is, um, I think he would be great at, at Leeds and if he gets an opportunity over there. But like you said, 14 weeks hopefully turns into three years. Well, the 14 weeks from Arthur's perspective is most likely because everyone's reporting that he wants to be the coach of the 18th franchise when it comes in. Apparently, it's meant to be announced in coming weeks, and it's likely going to be the Perth team. He's from Perth, so there's a lot of links there, and apparently he's just expressed his own interest for it, so that's maybe why he would be keen on that 14 weeks only. Yeah, understandable, I think. I don't, know, yeah, don't know when that team's going to get announced out, but even if we're talking about Perth, that, that's a big trip, Willie, these days. Um, you know, I think, what is it, five or five hours? You know, if, if I'm thinking about a, a New Zealand Warriors perspective, Warriors perspective, I think it's like a, it's nearly an, an eight hour flight. Um, they do they do enough flying at the minute, the Warriors. Yeah. And if, you add, if you're adding another team in that's further away, that's a lot of travel, a lot of travel for teams. It's a big change in time too. And then yeah. There is a bit of jet lag from when you when you get there. That's how long the flight is. But well, I get it then if that's the case, but when are they looking yeah. at coming in? You know, it won't be next year. Are they looking at 26 for, a, for Perth coming in if that's the case? Those are all things that he'll have to weigh up if he's the coach and if they're the franchise. Last bit of news then uh, for now is the Origin teams, currently only the Blues out. Uh, two changes, which one of them forced, one of them, uh, he uh, he just listened to Willie well, and Adam. Larry because, yeah. <laughs> so Bradman yeah. Best in for Luttrell and Mitch Barnett in for Haumole. What do you guys think of the team? Yeah, I think um, Bradman Best deserves his opportunity. I think he's been uh, great. You know, I think when you look at the centres and obviously injuries now, um, he's must be the next one in form that can get a job done. Been at that stage before, played at that level, knows what it's about. I think when he plays well, he's he's strong and hard to handle. And I guess we spoke about, you know, when I we spoke about changes last week and we spoke about who do you think and I just I just thought you know, to strengthen up the middle of the park, uh, especially for the middle pack, you've got Jake Javovich and Payne has to start. And if you put, put, bring Mitch Barnett in there, it only strengthens that middle of the park. He's an origin player, and he's been enormous for the Warriors this year um, and carries carries that middle of the park with his aggression and his intent at everything he does. He's a bit of a serious character as well. So you chuck him on there with Spencer Lenew, it's it, it's a swapping. You're just swapping front rowers for front rowers. He can get a job done if you need him to move to back row, but there'll be no need to move him to back row. He'll play straight through the middle of the park and I did say Yo or Hamoli will miss out unfortunately um, because I don't think they've done anything wrong but you know it just makes their team a lot more balanced I think through the middle of the park Yeah where they won the game in game two was they absolutely physically beat up Queensland and that's what they're looking to do again by putting Barnett on the bench they've got two power packs coming off the bench and him and Lanyu to come on and just try and dominate the pack. Interesting if some of the rumours and predictions are true that Queensland go with Ponga on the bench, mm. they'll go with well, uh, Aita, um, as opposed to what New South Wales are going with. But Bradman Best, yeah, I, I thought he was unlucky, especially with his form, how he's been. But a bit of deja vu, he comes in game three, he was outstanding last year, he's done it before, mm, yeah. uh, so he knows what it's all about. They lose Latrell, which is a big, big loss. But he's just as physical, probably not as athletic, and doesn't have the footballing ability that Latrell has. But he brings some uh, some other assets as well. So a yeah, dangerous team, dangerous New South Wales team again. Be, be an exciting decider. I'll keep my ear to the ground for the Queensland team, but from only seeing the New South team, are you guys still confident in uh, Queensland? <laughs> Oh. Always, always, yeah. always confident. Um, <laughs> you, you put you put both teams in the decider, and you get the 
beautiful game of rugby league and it doesn't matter who you put out there they're gonna they're gonna go at each other and like Willie said and what, like I said as well it's gonna be one for the middle of the park it's gonna be how you can build momentum on the back of tough carries um, being physical uh, being hard to handle intimidating the opposition with your carries and defensively and then trying to build pressure and um, I think both teams are going to have a good crack at this. Uh, it'll be a great, great spectacle. You know, sold out Suncorp Stadium. Uh, everyone's going to be booing New South Wales, and so am I. Boo to New South Wales. Um, and and just <laughs> hope, back from day, Bali. Throw cans on. <laughs> yeah, it's throwing uh, four X's and everything else on the field. So um, you know, up to Queensland is going to be an awesome game to watch that one. Um, you guys have talked about Ponga potentially on the bench. With all the news that's happened throughout the week, can you anticipate any other changes potentially coming through before we get this list out? Well, I think, yeah, well, we'll uh, just, I'll just go with the rumours. Yeah. Cobbo and uh, Gagai back on the side. They've lost mm. um, Oates and Murray Taolungi through injury. So I, with what they really need, Queensland, is some big outside backs that are going to carry from the backfield and get them out and find some field position. They, they weren't able to do that. And if Reese Walsh is the fullback, then they need four big centres and wingers yep. to, to do the job, get them on the front foot. If they, I think uh, Dan Gagai definitely does that. Uh, although he's been playing centre, he's been carrying so strong for Newcastle. And that's what Cobbo does. He just chews up metres. So... Yeah, if those two are back in, I think they'll be great inclusions. Yeah, those two will help, definitely. And like you said, Willie, the, the back three, even five, are, are key to how the game goes these days. And especially at origin level, you, you, the kicking and the position and the field position is going to be key. You've seen what Mitch Moses did to the uh, Queenslanders last time they played, put them deep in their try line, made them come off the line, and they just ran out of puff in the end, controlled the game with this kicking game. So you're going to have to try and bring have some bigger bodies. Your forwards are going to be working really hard. They'll front load all their energy defensively, and then your big outside backs are going to have to carry hard to bring the ball back. So, um, yeah, those big boys, you know, Gagai will be in there. I love what he's been able to do. He's never done a, a thing wrong in origin level, and then Cobbo will come in and be strong as well. So, yeah, be a be a massive contest for the outside backs for sure. Sweet as. We'll get back onto the team when it gets released uh, and just cover it again. But for now, let's move into the NRL games of the weekend. Starting off with the Rabbitohs versus the Eels. And, I mean, the Rabbitohs are just really back at this point. Fifth straight win. They're going to be charging now the Knights of last season style all the way to the finals, yeah. you'd think. Uh, and Parramatta just in the trenches at this point. Yeah, d- definitely. Um, I think kind of similar to, I guess, the Newcastle run with the way that they've been able to bounce back from, I guess, the ups and downs of, of their club and losing coaches. Uh, the biggest thing we've always spoken about on the show with their their change of their attitude and where they've gone. Kalama Tungi's been enormous for the middle of the park, a massive master joke of a shift of moving him to the middle of the park and then obviously we spoke about how Jack Wyden needed to be closer to the ball and playing in the halves he's definitely helped uh, Cody Walker the trail Mitchell and also the middle forwards be able to play a, a cool a, a strong solid style of football but the thing for me it's the defensive attitude that's changed uh, we watched games earlier on in the year where you know there was a try that they kick long and no one even there was 11 or 8 players never even got back on site to even compete but they're competing every single weekend uh, every time they put on their jersey they've been able to compete the last with the, how they've been going in the season they've competed for everything uh, so they're a quality side and they'll be a tough side if they keep building momentum obviously now the trail don't know how long the trail's going to be out there maybe it causes some some effect to the team because he obviously is a leader he brings brings confidence to the players around him and what he can create on the field. He's he's athletic and he's you know he's aggressive and I think everyone loves playing with him. So he, they build momentum on the back of some of his carries as well. And again, they're, they're a they're a tough team, the South Sydney Rabbitohs, and they're slowly sneaking in there. I think not, not too much. Well, they're talking about them, but they're not because I guess they're down outside the eight. But man, I'd be wary of those guys. They can do anything on their day. And again, like you said, from the bloody 
um, eels sitting in the trenches trying to find themselves out of there. And I think I said last week again, I think for me, it's their, their leaders through the middle of the park. That's where it's lacking for me. Uh, you know, Mitch Moses is trying to do what he can do. Uh, the, the outside backs, there's a mixture of young and old out there as well. They're debuting players, but I think the, the the leaders through the middle of the park have to be better, have to be stronger for for not only Mitch Moses and Dylan Brown, but also those younger outside backs as well. They just haven't seemed to find what they, they, their style this year has been, or the style that they've been playing hasn't worked. So they're going to have to try and figure out what they need to do real quickly. I don't think they're going to be in the eight. It's, it's disappointing because they're a strong club and there's some great players down there as well. Yeah, South Sydney, it's crazy. Yeah. Uh what confidence can do to you. You know, you, when you're winning and you're confident and your belief levels go up, as Blair alluded to, your effort levels go up as well. You work a bit harder, your trust levels go up and your teammates are next to you and that's where South Sydney are at. Now, there's some, been some tactical changes too and we've said it time and time again. Moving Jack White into six and getting his hands on the ball a couple of times when he carried and he's got that left foot step and he goes through the middle, he looks like the Jack White that made Canberra a threat. And that's why they got him. So that change to get him closer to the middle, closer to the ball, and his partnership with Cody Walker has been outstanding for them. But they're going off the back of Burgess, David Moali, and Kion Kolomotangi. Enormous how they've been. They're very, very dangerous. They're sneaking themselves in there. I think it was uh, a couple of weeks ago, people were saying they needed to win 11 out of 12 or something. Well, they've got five out of five. Mm. They'll be making six out of six, you know. They're slowly, slowly getting there and uh, very, very dangerous for any team they come up against. But Parramatta, they said this last week, they need to sort their coach out. They need to get sorted with who their coach is. Mm. Um, Mitchell Moses, surprisingly to me, he's already come out publicly and said, you know, this has got to be sorted, but we're still no closer. And <laughs> Brian Smith's name came up this week as one of the candidates. So, you now the longer it goes on, the, the crazier it gets. Um, even Trent Barrett spoke this week. He wants it sorted. I understand. He wants to know whether it's him or not, or he's, if he's going to be an assistant to somebody and know what his future is. But that's where the players are at. But back on the field, just got a little bit worse with Ginger Polo getting injured as well. So, yeah. you know, the players through the middle is Blairy saying they need to really step up to the mark, but they can't do so if they're injured and losing some of their top liners. Mm. Yeah, because Junior Polo's uh, injury, Liz Frank, the third one of the season after Ponga earlier and JMK last week. So he won't be back until at the very earliest, like, the last game of the season. So that is a big loss for them. And Ew. highlighting again the loss of Latrell Mitchell, uh, he has 12 trisis in the last six games for the Rabbitohs. It's going to be pretty tough losing his yeah. uh, influence in the team. Well, that's what it is, Ephraim. It's his influence and his leadership and his confidence that he brings to the team and the players around him. Um, when he's playing well, that team plays well. Uh, Cody Walker obviously runs on the back of him. Uh, you know, they they just enjoy having him out on the field when he's healthy, he's fit, excited, and smiling. Um, he's he's aggressive when he carries the ball. He makes it hard for players of uh, opposition to tackle. And yeah, like you said, that that's a massive step for for uh, Latrell and, and the Rabbitohs on where they've been able to put themselves to you know winning those five games straight. So it'll be interesting to see how they go without Latrell. He's a, he's a big part of that South Sydney Rabbitohs team. It's a bit like when uh, when we were kids and you had someone in your side who was the biggest and fastest in <laughs> giving the ball and he'd score he and try the game. But when you saw him, yeah, is he playing this week? Your confidence level yeah. grew. Yeah. And that's what he does to the team. He's fastest. Give the ball to fastest. Fastest will mm. do something. So, were you that guy in the team, Blair? <laughs> <laughs> I was I wasn't the fastest maybe the biggest oh, I played biggest. in the backs I played in the backs <laughs> but what it does do it gives Jai Gray an opportunity an extended yeah. opportunity to get back there he's never he hasn't put a foot wrong when he's been yeah. called upon 
and I, I think he'll uh, he'll grow even more for this experience and time. Next game up, Sharks versus Titans at CX Coffs International Stadium. It's <laughs> kind of an interesting name for a stadium. Uh, 2016 to the Titans. Uh, the Sharks started like picking up again, but again, they're just sort of falling off the top. They're down to fourth on the ladder now. What's going wrong for them, man? Oh, it's it's Ephraim, it's confidence, eh? It's confidence, and, and when things don't go right on the field, the confidence just falls off again, and and you you do the whole oh here we go again every kind of week when you when you work so hard at training and you put all the work in and which they would be doing, and then it just doesn't come off in the game, then the confidence just drops again. So I think you know everyone's obviously. They're talking about the Sharks and you know where they're going and why the, why they're not playing the way that they are because there is some quality players through their side. You know, Nico Hines, there's so much pressure on Nico Hines and he just looks a little bit unsettled and I know we keep talking about him but teams are figuring out that if they get underneath his skin, you can put him off his game and that's what kind of was happening on, on the game. I think he was getting into Aaron Clark or Aaron Clark was getting into him and you know, I think that's been the biggest thing for me is that there's 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 becoming a lot of niggle in the game, and they're niggling the the key players in teams, which then is uh, putting the opposition off, uh, which then is uh, you know lack they're lacking confidence, especially when you're already down and you're not winning games. There's guys like Aaron Clark that can niggle and put you off your game. But again, you got to give credit to the, the Gold Coast Titans. They went after it. They they put pressure on those guys. Aaron Clark, I think, like just mentioned, I thought he's been enormous. I think his first game back playing starting role against the Warriors back at Go Media Stam a, a while ago in the season, I thought that was his best game. And then he's just built some confidence on the back of that. Kieran Foran is obviously the leader to that team. And Keanu Kinney, we keep mentioning what he does. Man, um, th- that many high tackles on that kid just because he's ducking and, and weaving underneath players and he's got sharp feet. Um, he's he's guaranteed a penalty every time he runs a ball sometimes because he's so low and, and competitive. But I'm enjoying what he's been able to do at the back of the field. I think those guys, he's been a, a, a bit of a revelation this year at the fullback position as well for the Gold Coast Titans and a key for the Gold Coast Titans as well. Yeah, I I'm really liking watching the Gold Coast play, the way they play since that Warriors game. Uh, they're not yeah. the biggest pack, but they work hard and they play across the ground. They've got Isaac Liu, who comes off the bench. Again, not a big man, but plays way above his size. And him and Aaron Clark that we're talking about, Ken and Palacia, uh, Pahalu off the bench. Uh, they've just got some yeah. grafters, grafters that allow the halfbacks to play on the front foot. They've allowed Kieran Foran to play at the line. He's playing so tough at the minute. He gets beat up every time he, he carries the ball. But he's willing to do what's right for his team. And hence why people like Keanu Kinney and uh, Alufi Carparera are getting all the space and tries that they are. All the talk going into the game was about Fafida. And this was his last trial. And there was an opportunity for him to stake a claim. And I, no, I thought he did. I thought he did a good job. If he misses out, on selection, I don't think he could be disappointed in the fact that he's given it everything that he could. I thought he did. It was one of the games that I, I sort of thought throughout he involved himself. He didn't go missing, which he has the ability to do. And I thought uh, if that was a trial for him, I thought he'd, he tried to take it with both hands. But Cronulla, they're in a hole. They're a totally different team to the, to, to the side that went seven in a row. If, uh, just individually... I'm watching uh, Ronaldo Mulitalo. He just doesn't have that carry threat at the moment. He was bumping everybody off at the start of the season. He had spiders on him. Mm. Nobody. But players like himself and uh, the guys through the middle. uh, Interesting, really, looking at the dejection of Nico Heinz's face when he got interviewed after the game. It said so much, just where they're at and how, how low they are in confidence. And when you when you lose and you go on a run of losing games, you, know, you, you can say the right things. And, you know, we've got to go back to work. We've got to you know, go back to the drawing board, come back in on Tuesday. But when, when you're losing week on week on week and it goes for five weeks as it has for them, you know, what are we doing? What are, what are we doing? And some of it's their effort. 
it's none of it's their confidence. Because they've shown already this season that what they're able to do, which is going to find the belief and confidence again to try and strike that up. Um, for the Titans, one thing I'm very excited for is when these two other like A1 fullbacks for them do return. I am excited for what Hasler is thinking that he's going to do because there's absolutely no way he can drop Keanu Kidney. That guy is one of the best players in the NRL right now. He's playing. He's playing enormous, um, and he's being brave and tough for a small for a small guy. Uh, you know, taking at least two carries a set, which is what the fullbacks are doing these days. But you think for someone of his size, he'd maybe just take that the kick return and then let the other big guys do it. But he's he's tackling, taking the first kick, he's taking the third one as well, and, and carrying the ball just as hard for a small guy. Getting in behind the ruck, he's brave. Um, I, I, you've got to find ways to keep him in the game. He's got to be a starting player. I think he stays at fullback. Um, because yeah, it'd be like you said, it'd be it'd be interesting to see how they put all these fullbacks on the field and what position they play. Yeah, my for mine, it's Campbell to six, Brimson on the bench. Yeah, Brimson on the bench. Yeah. Got some yeah. utility value, and he can play anywhere. As much as he's a he's a highly paid player, a dangerous one. I think to fit them all in right now mm. on form, I think that's their best combination. You don't think you can put him at centre? Back at Brimson. where he was at the start of the season? Yeah, Brimson. You could do, you could do, but a bit like uh, we're talking about Jack White, you're not involving him as much. You know, I'd, mm. I'd take him off the bench and put him in somewhere close to the ball. He could be at 14. Yeah. Imagine, but th- I mean, no one's supporting around and play a bit of ball play, running at tired middles. Yeah, definitely. Mm. I, I think so. T- I think so too. Willie chuck him on can play a, a, a thir- thirteen role, a thirteen role off the bench, and um, you know ball play for the middle and play some shape off the back of him, and much really more of a running thirteen role too, f- to be honest, because he's good with his feet and he's sharp. So, yeah, I think definitely come off the bench. Keanu stays at the back. Campbell, that's that's great. I think that's we might be able to coach the Titans one day, Willie. <laughs> <laughs> We're is that a thing now? Like having smaller 13s, <laughs> that seems to be a theme of the modern NRL. Is that a thing? Well, the game is that fast. A players, recent thing? The players We're talking about it. Yeah, they... Yeah. Hello? Oh, yes. That, yes. I thought someone smile, was going to say that. Yes. yes no, I, I think this is... I think this is I, yeah, I think, this I is think, the perils I, of delay. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think that's where the game's going. Uh, you know, with these smaller these smaller halves, these smaller fullbacks, but these players running around the middle of the park. I think, you know, Connor Watson's a prime example is his utility value. I think what, one weekend he was playing in the middle, then moved out to the centre position and still killed it out then. I think that's similar to what AJ Brimson can bring. I think he's kind of a similar player to Connor Watson in the way that they carry the ball around the middle of the park, but also challenge, you know, the opposition every time they run. So the game's moving that way, and I think that's where he kind of sits in, I think. Mm. Next up, game, uh, Broncos versus yeah, Panthers. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's Willie. I think the Wi Fi in front of that is a little bit Where'd off. You go? You it's, that, it's that power pole that fell down, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Up there. Oh, wasn't Come that on, your mates, Willie? <laughs> <laughs> we're, doing, we're doing so well, guys. <laughs> nah, it's we're just our so island's well. infrastructure in Samoa and in Bali, just much better yeah, than yeah. in New Zealand. <laughs> yeah, ironic. Yeah. Uh, what next were you game, Willie. We'll just we'll just leave Willie there. <laughs> we'll just leave him smiling. <laughs> we'll just keep keep him smiling. We we'll just keep rolling on. <laughs> yeah. All right. Go away from. <laughs> next game: Broncos versus Panthers at SunCorp. Fourteen to six to the Panthers. It was a bit of a slugfest. You know, they were putting their back into the game. Really, Reese Walsh looked good on his first game for the Broncos since uh, round 12, I believe it was. Yeah. Uh, but Panthers too good. 
Yeah, it might be just you and I having this conversation from about the Broncos and Panthers game. Um, I guess all the pressure was on the Brisbane Broncos, but also the, the grand final rematch uh, and, and what that was going to look like. Broncos getting all their origin players back after resting them against, I guess, the Warriors and, and having a disappointing loss there. So the, the expectation of them to turn up in sub, and play against the Penrith Panthers was huge and enormous for the context of where they sit in the competition for the Brisbane Broncos. Um, they, they, yeah, like you said, Reese Walsh, I thought, you know, had some brilliant moments or brilliant moments. Uh, nice try down the outside there with the speed, carried fast, he was good. Had some great opportunities, but again, like like you said, the Panthers just do what they do really well. Um, they must have had a bit of a, a game plan or a, a tactic that they like to run here from where they dropped a lot of their centers back through the middle of the park, and I guess they were trying to challenge. I don't know what it was, but I was trying to try and work it out because they kept dropping centers, tongue all back through, uh, Cole back through the middle of the park and testing at the mm. middle, middle of the Brisbane Broncos and I guess how they can defend. Um, but they were just, I guess they were set. Uh, it wasn't most probably the prettiest game and most probably the most complete game for both teams. But man, it's holy hecka. We just took <laughs> and, and, and he's back in there. And he's back and just jump straight and when he's ready um yeah so the Penrith Panthers great win from the Penrith Panthers up against uh, a Broncos team but under still under a bit more pressure because they're falling down the table we're just talking about the Penrith Panthers and the Broncos bro oh, he's frozen again oh well if <laughs> he just comes back and frozen <laughs> back <away. laughs> he's coming he's coming in and out bro <laughs> he's blowing up yeah what's good <laughs> <laughs> good, the good old internet. Maybe, maybe we don't shout out where you are. You know, oh, no. hotel Wi-Fi. Yeah, so yeah, so for me, Ephraim, a massive game for both the clubs, but more so the Brisbane Broncos, and didn't manage to get the job done under a little bit more pressure. Again, they go into Origin, some of their Origin players, and I guess the important thing now for for both teams, but also the Brisbane Broncos, is how they kick on after the Origin break, because um, it just becomes a tougher competition now. Every team's fighting for position in the eight, and the competition's so tight through the middle of the middle of the ladder that a win will shoot you closer to the eight, a loss will shoot you further down, and teams below are coming up high in the comp as well. Yeah, because especially the Broncos um, have lost four of their past five at Suncorp, which is just a reflection of how things are going for them at the moment. It's not really a fortress. One of the great stadiums of of the mm. NRL, and they are not getting it done there. They're on the slide. Um, I can't remember where they are in the eight. I think have they dropped out of the eight? Yeah, I think, I think they they're sitting about tenth. So after they had picked things up again, now it's dropping off a bit. Just on yep. the um, Panthers though side of the ball, Mitch Kenny. What yep. a beast he is against the Broncos. He has four career tries and three of them against the Broncos, one of them in a grand final. Wow. <laughs> what a man he is. <laughs> yeah. I think Willie's back here now. We got him back. Yo. I think so. I think so. I hope so. Hi, bro. There, oh, there he is. Hi, my bro. Welcome back. Little mouse is going around the wheel. Had to feed him. <laughs> 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 We're just talk, talking about Mitch Kenny's performance, Willie, against the Brisbane Broncos. Yeah, it was, it was outstanding. I, uh, you know, really impressed with what he brings. He, a lot was said when they lost uh, Coruscant and how they were going to be, and he was the heir apparent, and he's really stepped up in a big way. Just goes about his job. Must be awesome to play off the back of a pack like they've got. Mm. You know, you got Fish and Moses Liotta who just punch holes for him to play off the back of. But his awareness and his guile, I mean, he's been important. We've just spoken about Jerome Luai having to step up to the mark in the absence of Nathan Cleary, but he's had a big say in it too. You know, he's picking the right ways to play, the right times to run. Doesn't really have a kicking game, but defensively, as tough as they come. Uh, Willie, did you see, I just asked uh, Ethram before, spoke to Ethram before about how the Penrith Panthers were dropping their centres back through the middle of the park. Did you notice that in the game? Yeah, yeah. There was a, did you, you think there was a reason? Yeah, did you think that the reason around that game? Because I haven't seen, I don't, I don't know if I've, 
I haven't seen them do that too much often, but I thought there was a massive play on the Brisbane Broncos games. Yeah, it looked like they were trying to punch through the middle and keep mm. going at the middles of, of the Broncos. Really, one of the hardest things to do, <laughs> or the hardest person to try and tire out is Payne Haas. He just doesn't tire. Mm. But you've got to try and yep. work him over as you can and work the people around him. And uh, it looked like that's what they were trying to do, trying to yep. get some people way and trying to get, especially to that four man, to try and get yep. those middles to really work hard and, and tie back over. So yeah, it's a tactic that they used to use especially when they had Crichton and Tungle yes. in the centres. Yes. And it looks like they're, they've gone uh, a little bit back in time a little bit with some of their plan. What you'll see with the Panthers now is them, they're preparing for the playoffs. They've started to prepare mm. and mm. put their plans in place. Uh, you can look forward to that coming in the, in the next couple yeah. of weeks. Well, uh, well, understanding that the, the game is won through the middle of the park, so the more fatigue you can put into those middle forwards, the harder it is for them to make decisions under fatigue, whether they're moving laterally or being effective with their contact. Um, you're putting smaller guys with, with sharper feet around them, getting one-on-one tackles, being loose in contact, and then being able to create the momentum off the back of that, a la Mitch Kenny doing his thing, and then Jerome Luai getting the ball wide on, on a long left pass and then coming off his left foot and stepping back through the middle again. So I think, like you said, they're, they're prepping for what's to come um, and understanding that this is where the game is won and lost through the middle of the park. Put a bit of fatigue into them, get them s- switching off of that second and then not being able to get into a tackle and then obviously opportunities come on the back of that. So, yeah, I just thought it was a, um, a tactic that I, I, I just saw. I saw that in the game and I was thinking, okay, that's what they're trying to do. Injuries in this game, uh, Dane Laurie and Jock Madden both hamstrings. Dane Laurie obviously has been a nice uh, mm. backup to Dylan Edwards. Played so well that I'm pretty sure it's tactical. He displaced Taruva on the wing for this game. Uh, and then Jock Madden obviously has been filling in for Adam Reynolds. Both of them now out. Do those Are those big impact injuries to those teams? Yeah, I think uh, definitely the Broncos, Jock Madden. Um, they, I don't know when Adam Reynolds is back in the park, but he's been filling that space of Adam Reynolds and they're really missing Adam Reynolds in his way that he can control games, his leadership and what he brings to the team and the confidence. So then you lose another half in, in, in the Broncos and you're looking for much for another younger player to come in and try and fill this space. Fingers crossed for the Brisbane Broncos, it's not a major, but they can get Adam Reynolds back to help and guide them on their run at the back end of the season, like I said previously about the back end after Origin and how they back up and where they want to go. Um, so I think the biggest loss is most probably if they don't get out the Reynolds back as Jock Madden for, for the Brisbane Broncos, especially on the way that they're playing at the moment and how competitive this competition has been. Yeah, 100%. They, they, should, they won't lose Dylan Edwards again, fingers crossed, but they could, that won't hurt them too much, the day to lower one. And if... If something was to happen to Dylan Walker, uh, Dylan Edwards, then they'd probably find someone else, slot them. They've got the McLeans waiting in the wings, yeah. winger fullbacks. You know, they could uh, possibly put Turuva to fullback. He came through the junior system, played for Fiji as a fullback, so they've got some cover. Yeah, the biggest one out of those two is definitely Jock Madden. It'd be interesting to see what the Broncos do to cover that spot in the absence of Adam Reynolds. Because uh, yeah, there's no doubting that they miss him almost as much, mm. if not more, as Parramatta miss Mitchell Moses. They yeah. need him back out there. And if there's no backup half, they're going to have to put some sort of makeshift half back in there. Adam Reynolds is set to come back in round 22, so that's still three more games for the Broncos. Oh, two more games for the Broncos until he's set to come back. But you know how injuries can be, and in terms of injury returns. Nathan Cleary is supposed to be back for the Panthers next game in round 20 because they have a bye this week wow. coming. So that will be exciting. He'll finally be back. Yeah, it's exciting for the Panthers. But I think they, um, you know, like good clubs similar to the Melbourne Stormers, the people that come into the system, into the structure, just get a job done. So 
Barry can afford to sit him on the sidelines and make sure that he comes back 100% because I'm, I'm assuming last time they did it, he may have not been ready because he's done this, he's done a hammy again. So I think now they've been able to build this confidence with the group that they've had. They can sit these guys on the sideline, bring them back 100 and then push on for the back end of the, of the season. And he'd be a massive addition to the Penrith Panthers and they're sitting nice and high on the top of the uh, up in the top of the competition so confidence will be high again when he comes back into the team Yeah, just what Blair is saying about people stepping in and understanding their role within the system and how how they have to execute their job um, they picked up a young halfback who was struggling at, at Huddersfield last year and Jack Cogger Jack Cogger got an opportunity when Nathan Cleary was injured and in origin he proved himself worthy enough in that opportunity that he got to get a place on the bench. He ended up being a grand final winner. Mm. So, in mm. absence now, Brad, Brad Schneider's stepped up. He's been the halfback. Same thing could happen to him. 12 months ago, he was playing for Hulk KR. So, if you come into these clubs and you're willing to understand your role, understand your opportunities and what the systems are, when you step in, don't, you don't have to be a Nathan Cleary. You just have to support Mitch Kenny and Jerome Luai. Do your job. Do it well. Give us some trust that we'll keep you there. If they make the grand final, Brad Schneider might be another Jack Cogger. Mm. Mm. Awesome. All right, we'll stop teasing the people. We'll finally move <laughs> on to the game that, of course, all of our fans <laughs> want to hear about. <laughs> Bulldogs versus the Warriors at a core stadium. 13-12 to the Bulldogs off the back of Matt Burden for the second week in a row. Drop goal off the post and in. A lot to talk about in this game, so I'll let you guys take it away. Yes, yeah, solid game. Um, I thought it was you know, high, high intensity. Um, quality was, you know, first class. I thought, you know, both teams were competitive. They went at each other. It was a war of attrition. Um, you know, the, the Warriors will be disappointed in this, this game. Um, I thought they were good enough, even though they lost half of their outside, all the outside backs. Um, you know, their two wingers were gone, and I thought they started the game with intent. I thought, you know, if I, we, I, we go back to the Gold Coast Titans game, they turned up, it just didn't look good. I thought on the back of their Gold Coast Titans game, they need to turn up the Broncos with an attitude to go after the Broncos. I didn't think they got there as well. But this game, I thought they turned up from the get-go and defensively were strong from from the start. The outside backs carried hard. Off the back of Dallin and Marcelo and Chance, created momentum and got down there and scored some points. Uh, But again, with what the... Canterbury Bulldogs have been able to do this year is that they've just stayed in the fight there they're working hard together as a group like obviously they scored two tries so defense for the Warriors were pretty good they scored two tries off kicks Uh, they'll be disappointed in but the Warriors will understand that they weren't they didn't break their line through them the only time they looked likely was when Josh Curran had a nice little short ball nearly got over the line but a a try saving tackle from uh, Chance to stop him short of the line but other than that I thought it was a quality game both teams uh, you know, one's, one's going to be disappointed, but the other ones are really happy with, you know, t- coming away with the one point. They had opportunities to win their game, the Warriors, uh, with the ball. And in Golden Point, I thought there was an opportunity there when uh, he got to stole the ball back, um, stole the ball back from dummy half. Uh, and they dived on the ball when the Penrith, uh, when the Bulldogs guys weren't looking oh. around and not playing what's in front of Freddie Lassett. Fred, Freddie Larson dives in, gets the ball. And I think there was, I think at that time it was 8 minutes 23 to go and I thought that there's an opportunity right now to hit a one point. They didn't hit a one point and I think that that's where it may have shifted the momentum. Again, some of those bombs that Matt Burden were putting up, I just felt like it was going to be the Warriors' day because every time the ball hit the ground, no one caught it. It bounced into the Warriors' hands. Same thing Ooh. with the drop kick, hit hit the post, falls down, jumps into support, pops into someone's hands. So I was like, oh, it has to be the Warriors' day. And they got great two opportunities to kick a goal. Chanel, I thought he striked them really well. Um, but again, what not to win. And, and the Dogs come away with another strong performance and get the win and keep building. Yeah, they're another side who's brimming full of confidence and it's showing in the way they're playing and the belief they've got to just stay in an arm wrestle and just keep performing their roles. And they're almost like a mini Penrith Panthers 
they understand their system and they're just going through the processes of it. There was a long period of time before the, the, the dogs drew the game. They were behind it. And rightly so, the Warriors were very, very good that first half. The lead that they had at half time, they really deserved it. And they defended really well. Both teams, I thought, threw everything at each other. And both teams defended really well with a lot of energy. There was some massive hits, kick out, come up with a massive mm. shot. Mm. And uh, ended up coming up with the try that brought the dogs back in the game. So, yeah, they both had opportunities. I thought Chanel had the better opportunities to get the drop goals. They set it up. They had a bit more time, but Reed Marnie came out and just got enough on the ball and was charged out to deflect it, push it away. And the seven tackle set, they go down and the man with the big left left foot, the biggest left foot in the NRL, Matt Burton, just does it again. But yeah, a great performance. They can be proud. They can be disappointed, the Warriors. I think they can be really proud of their performance. And I think the fans will be really proud of how they played. It doesn't help them on the ladder, but they, they can take a lot of confidence. It'll be interesting to see how how chances with his injury. Roger got a chance to go back to fullback. But one thing for me, and I'm interested in this, because we were sort of watching how many people in New Zealand stuck with the Warriors through the golden point and missed the start of the All Blacks. Oh, hard. Hard. You know, that was the Razors' first game, the All Blacks' first game, but everyone was on the edge of their seat where I was watching. Yeah. You couldn't switch it over because you waited no. for the game to finish. Yeah. Did you yeah. see that for me? Yeah, there were so many. Um, I think there's a couple of controversial moments as well that the Warriors mm-hmm. will be disappointed with. But at the same time, on the flip side, the, the Dogs fans would say, oh, well, you had your opportunities to win the game anyway. And again, you don't want to leave it down to these referees' decisions and, and whether it's a right or wrong decision. Um, you don't want to leave it down. It shouldn't come down to those things, but sometimes it does. And Warriors fans will be disappointed of some of the calls that got let go. I think, obviously, the hit on Tamari Martin, um, that that was a, a moment there that they could have given a penalty, and they should have, to be honest. Um, it was late, it was high. I think Jamin Salmon has, I think he broke his jaw. I think he's mm-hmm. broken his jaw. So the contact the contact was high, um, and it was late. But again, on the flip side, you'd say, well, you had your opportunities to win these ga- this game. You should be able to ice those moments. And also, I think, you know, the charge down on, a charge down on Chanel from um, Reed. I just thought, um, he was he wasn't square at marker, but that's been real picky. That's us us. That's me being a Warriors fan and being real picky around these little moments in the game. But at the same time, they should have been better. Highlight for me, boys. Highlight for me. Leka uh, oh, 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 this, oh. this this kid, <laughs> mate. This 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 kid this kid can play rugby league. He's he's naturally gifted, naturally gifted. And you know, I caught I was at obviously with working with Sky and we we're doing the game, and I um, was lucky enough to. Be able to coach Lika at SG Ball level, and he's only just turned 18. Um, he wow. played five games for five games for SG Ball, and pretty much they said, "Nah, he's got to go up a grade," which is all good because I guess when you talk about pathways, you're creating opportunities for these young kids. And if he's good enough to play at 17 New South Wales Cup, which I think he ended up playing 16 games in New South Wales Cup, and is and being a 17 year old and carving up in there as well. So to get an opportunity, he's been on a bit of a roller coaster bro. he's young he's young you know what I mean the, he's turned up he's mostly turned up to training late sometimes because he's you know forgot something at home and just caught in and said I'm sick where you've got to come in at NRL level and see the doctor you know what I mean but he's learned some lessons on his journey and he's 18 years old he gets an opportunity to go out there he's actually got more time than he was expected to have his first carry I was like yeah that's what you want to see on a day is carry the ball that hard and that strong and do it the way he did and then the opportunity to nearly ice the game for the Warriors. Man, that would have been an awesome oh. moment if he scored that try on debut oh. on the back of his first carry and then to be able to score that try. But credit again, like we've said, to both teams and obviously the Bulldogs defensively, they just hung in there and turned up and saved the try. But this kid's got some, he's got some massive wraps on him at the club and he's going to be a star for the future for the Warriors. And, you know, they've just re-signed him. So, He's in the in the top thirty. He's going to go do big things. Adam, what, well, what position is he? He can run. 
he, yeah, he, he's quick, he's athletic, he's fast, he's strong. Um, he, when we played him in HD ball level, he's played in the middle of the park, he's played back row, and he's also played centre. So <laughs> yeah, he can. Yeah. He, he, it's great to have someone that's so uh, versatile, but also so effective in what they have for position. Uh, there was a couple of times there I thought, gee, when they were coming down his side, attacking the uh, Bulldogs were attacking their, uh, the. The Warriors right where he was defending and they were getting on his outside a little bit but he just kept, kept competing um, and that's what I like about Lika and the way that he played is that he's a competitor he wants to win mm. he tries hard and he just got a job done man you know you, you, you get your debut game and they go yep you're gonna come on at this time and you're gonna be playing in the middle of the park yes it started like that and then he ended up in the center paying most probably more minutes than he ever had it and didn't look out of place. Um, a, a bro for each. I can't wait to see this guy grow. And man, he's going to be a great talent for the Warriors. Um, I love that right foot step that he used on Connor. <laughs> Oh, he he went right. He went left and back to the right again. Like he's he's, he's a well he's a well balanced um, well he's a well balanced player too with his feet. Like even though he yeah. did, he did three three steps and got him. I've seen times where he's done step people fallen on the ground, got back up, bumped up someone and spun around. You know, so like he he he's he's got a good balance. He's got a good balance with his body and his great awareness around how strong and powerful he is. But also, you know, if he. You know, I've seen him fall over and get back up and bounce around and do things. So, man, he is he is a great talent, this kid. I can't wait to see him keep growing. Obviously, Willie said before, uh, backline issues for the Warriors. Chan's going down later on, Dallin going down, and Marcelo as well. That will be at least le- next week without any of the three of those guys, you'd think. Uh well, so, yeah. what are the Warriors going to do with their backline? By so by this by this weekend. Uh, oh, that's so right. An, yeah. an opportunity to an opportunity to rest those guys and reassess and uh, reevaluate where they sit. Um, what is it? A calf strain for chance? Uh, HIA. So Dallin will be back. Marcelo. Mm-hmm. Marcelo is hammy. Uh, groin. Groin. So it all depends on, on how they pull up after this and how they travel during the week to hopefully go next week because um, down in the outside backs, you don't really want too many injuries to outside backs. We, we're, we're lucky enough to have Roger there that can fit into the fullback position, but you also go Tane. So so Tane will most probably end up coming in at, at some in some capacity, which is lucky. you got Edward Corsi down at New South Wales Cup. Um, Moala, Moala Graham down there as well. So... Uh, there is a couple of guys that can fill in that position, but you want your best players on the field and uh, an opportunity to see how they go over the next uh, week and a bit before their next game. I think while we're talking about the injuries, I think Warriors need to be praised for the courage and the character they showed. 18 minutes, I think they played mm. with one sub. Mm. Yeah, uh, I, I thought I thought they were going to fall away, and there were moments where it looked like they were going to fall away. But they just stuck at it. They stuck at it. Very uh, similar to what they did against Penrith when they got them. I wouldn't. Yeah. No, they showed the character with that one man on the bench. The middles, Adam Fanua Blake stayed out there, played a lot longer minutes, just kept punching holes through the middle, defending hard. They had a lot of character from them. Well, Dylan Walker and Mitch Barnett, bro, like those two had to play enormous minutes, and, and you think. When the times when the times were tough on the game, and like you said, Willie, you thought they were just going to fall off because they had no outside backs to carry their ball back. And normally your outside backs take your one, two, and three. The forwards had to take your two and three tackles or runs and your four and your five, and you're looking for someone to find some energy, you know what I mean? And they were so bunched, but they still managed to find something. And like you said, they got to be praised for the effort that they put in. Mitch Barnett, obviously a reward for what he's been able to do and the way that he carried the ball, but also Dylan Walker's been massive for the Warriors as well for the middle of the park. Mitch Barnett, 226 metres, one try assist. Five tackle breaks, five offloads, 56 tackles, two misses. Pretty oh, insane. Only went off. He's he went off uh, for about five minutes, I think. Five minutes. Went off. Yeah, five and then minutes. the Warriors started maybe getting a bit shaky and they immediately just put him back on and to steady the ship. Yeah. He, he is a beast. And Dylan Walker played the entire game. So, fuck those two. Yeah, and- 
and when Dylan Walker gets tired, you can see it. Uh, but I just didn't <laughs> see it. They, they they were hungry. They were they were keen just to keep pushing. And I think off the back of someone like Mitch Barnett's carries, everyone else got energy. You know, Adam Fanua, Blake, and and when you're looking at the back end of the game and the golden point, you're thinking. Adam, you need to carry hard. You're looking for all the middles just to get them down the field. You know what I mean? And they got them, they got the they got them into the great right positions to win the game. And that's what everyone's trying to say is like take the ref out of it. Yes, there were some bad calls, but at the same time they got into these positions even with the amount of players they had on the bench or on the sidelines, and still were able to nearly get their game over the line. We'll, we'll be disappointed definitely, but again, move on. Got to go again. Last thing for the Warriors, Torhu Harris uh, was ruled out pre-game. Uh, on the NRL casualty ward on their website, it says his injury is his wrist and it's indefinite. So when it, indefinite is like people like Tom Flegler is indefinite for his nerve injury, uh, Jermaine Hopgood with his back. I didn't realise Torhu's injury just had got that bad all of a sudden, or are they just keeping him out until they're sure that he's ready to come back? Um, I, I think it's a wrist injury that he's carried from last year as well. Um, he's, he is mummified when he's out on that field <laughs> with how much tape, <laughs> with how much, um, tape he's rolling around. And um, like the game's moving quick. The game's moving quick now. These young kids are physical and some of our older guys on the field are feeling every part of it. And Toys most probably a... a uh, one that's feeling a lot of the contact and a lot of the tackling and having these little injuries and you can't afford to be rolling around on the field and we've seen what Sean Johnson was like when he was ha- wasn't a hundred percent. You can't afford not to be on the field and not play at a hundred percent with your body uh, because the game's moving too quick and then the outside noise comes in and then the pressure comes onto you. So I think it's an old injury that has most probably not come right. Um, it would be hard to see Toyo come back this year for sure. I think, uh, you know, I think he has to look after himself. Similar to uh, Sean Johnson, you don't want to, and I guess for Sean, you don't want to go out the way he's going. You want to make sure that their Achilles is is a hundred percent before you get on the field, and you wouldn't want an injury to say, you know, be the end of your your career and and not allow you to finish the way you want. But not everyone gets a fairy tale ending, and I guess these two boys uh, need to look after themselves and get themselves right so that they can be a hundred percent when they get on the field and play. Yeah, with players like Tohu, they'll play through pain. They'll just keep rolling themselves out. And as Blair is saying, if he's got a sore elbow, just strap it up. I'll go out and play. Got a sore knee, yeah, strap that up, I'll play. And sometimes you've got to save the player from himself. You know, sometimes you just go, hey, no, not this week. Not this week. Um, it is interesting, Ephraim, what indefinite means and um, to what detail uh, the injury is. So we'll have to see, we'll wait to see how significant it is, what it is. Is it a break? Is it a nerve? Is it something you're saying like Flagler? Yeah, only time will tell. And you know, I think it's, there's a little bit of that too with Tohu. This is not your time to run out. We'll give you a rest, give your body a rest, mm. and we'll get you back in to finish the season. Hopefully. Sweet as we'll move on. But just, well, last thing, read Marnie. <laughs> just, just, for our, just for our Warriors fans, just give them one more. Give them one more. <laughs> nah, it's, this, ain't, this ain't Warriors. This is Bulldogs. Read Marnie. Okay. The man. I love him. <laughs> Grub and hard worker. He made 70 tackles. Yeah, well, you know, last week Ephraim, we said if the Warriors were going to win this game and, and stop him from being a grub, they're going to have to run straight through them and make him make tackles. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think this is the quietest. This is the quietest I've seen Reed all year. Um, and I think if you're going to play against the Bulldogs, this is the way you get get into the into the Bulldogs players, not by being pushy and niggly and shove and shove everyone around. It's to send your big players at Reed and make him make tackles. So 70 tackles is a, a, a massive amount of tackles to be able to play because it takes away the energy out of him, but also takes away his effectiveness around the ruck. Like 
he's been pretty much having free reign the way that they've been playing, you know, ducking out from dummy half. I didn't see too many of that against the Warriors um, because he obviously made 70 tackles and he had to work really hard. So, you know, he is he is the grub of the NRL and he's doing it really well consistently every week. But this week, last weekend against the, the Warriors, I thought he was quite quiet. Mm. The man with the magic fingers touching the ball to <laughs> save that <laughs> drop goal as well. Yeah, yeah. All right, next game, Tigers versus Storm uh, at Leichhardt, 40-28 to 28 from the Storm. Uh, it's actually the Storm's most points or second most points conceded of the season. Uh, so mm. props to the Tigers for that. But, of course, they conceded 40 points, so they're not really going to be in a position to win with that defence. Yeah. Might be, might be you and I again, Ephraim, on this one. Um, the, <laughs> fortress, the, the Fortress of Leichhardt uh, hadn't lost a game there this year. Um, and, and the Tigers were going in there confident. I thought they started okay. Uh, they scored some points. But like we always said with the Melbourne Stormers, the game is never over till it's over. And uh, they just come over the top of, top of the the Tigers at the end of the day and put the, the obviously the 40 points on them um, credit to like you said to the, the Tigers they worked hard they played their shape he's back again uh, he, they played their shape oh and, and, and then we've and then we've lost them again oh no he's back here so um, they played they scored some nice give tries they scored some nice sh- they, <laughs> give it time they scored some nice tries but they were up against they were up against a well oiled machine of the Melbourne Storm and Jerome Hughes for me is the best half in the game right now doing what he's doing for this club with out having the support around them or the quality of the players around him to be able to do what he does um he always plays you know it was like he had spiders on him he ducks he weaves he kicks people into positions he's got a great kicking game great passing game normally nine out of nine times out of ten chooses the right option and and picks and sticks with it most of the times and he obviously brings confidence to the group around him Wishart's been doing an enormous enormous job and my favorite player in the competition so far long is just jumping around and i love what he does you know for me you know for me this is this is what i don't get well i know i get it like you set up a scrum in the middle of the park you put everyone else on the right hand side and you give them a two on two on two and you give give it to so far long and give them a one-on-one and nine times uh, actually i haven't seen him being tackled yet ten times out of ten he scores tries he he, he looks at the opposition you don't know what he's going to do if he's going to jump in and do a goosey on you or go left foot right foot but he just burn him on the outside you know, had a look, had a look when he scored his try. I just love what he does, and I love how he backs himself when he plays. Um, and that's the biggest thing for me is, you know, they know what Sua can do down at that club, so they set up plays to help these players excel. And I thought that was a prime example. And I've seen it a couple of times now where they've set up a scrum, and they've put it, put him on, and given him a one on one. And every time he scored a try, so you know, credit to to what the Storm are doing, sitting nice and high on the table and being real consistent and still not having their full complement of their best 13 on the field. Yeah, I don't think either team, and, and Craig Bellamy said this after the game, that he wasn't too happy with how they defended. They leaked quite a few tries and the amount of points that they conceded to the Tigers was disappointing, but they also gave the Tigers some credit, especially uh, Api Coruscant. But definitely the Tigers will be disappointed with their defensive effort. I said it last week. I'm not sure what system they're employing, but uh, there was a play there with Jerome Hughes. and It was as much about Jerome Hughes being outstanding as it was the deficiency of the Tigers' defence, where the winger shoots up the centres coming back. Jerome Hughes finds a space, runs 30 metres and sets up the winner for a try. Um, mm. You know, you've got to be smart halfback. You've got to be athletic like Jerome Hughes is to take it. But they made it easier for him. The Tigers with some of the poor defence. And they're, they're just not clicking there in that department. But the the, the Storm, they do what, as Blair said, they do what the Storm does. Unfortunately for Sewer not to get his first try, when just yeah. got a knock on when the kick bounced and, and went forward. But Sewer, he just burned Jerome Buller. And Jareen Buller just to go around them easily. A little bit like Weeks did to him a couple mm. of weeks ago. But, yeah, I, I think it's crazy 
to go a four and two split for the scrum on the middle on Sua. But what it also does is, and why they do it, you either put three on Sua or you put three on Jerome Hughes on the other side. Jerome Hughes. Yeah. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Yeah. Such is their danger. So, yeah, we set up the twos. Sua's going to take it every time and he's burning everyone. Yeah. You, you have to. Like, that's just. You're, you're playing to the strengths of your team, but like you said, Willie, is you've got Jerome Hughes on one side and they've got shape. And then you've just got uh, uh, Sua just standing there and you're going to give him the ball. Like, there's no way. Even if, at, at worst, it's a legs tackle and we you still make 12, 13 metres. You know what I mean? Like, it's not, you're mostly not setting it up as a scoring play. You're setting it up for Sua just to make some metres, but he can turn uh, metres. Uh, uh, play into scoring points, and that's what he does. Um, Pat he still hasn't about scoring tries. He's still trying to dive. Yeah. He's going to knock himself out again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pappenhausen again had the reduced carry meters, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago when he first came back from his injury. Had a rest last week. Comes back, eighty-four meters run, but. He was not, uh, his potency was not reduced by that. Three line breaks, a try, so seven tackle breaks. He was still getting back to it. Uh, Perfect time for him to come back into the team, I feel like. And along with Tyron Wishart as well. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry? Did he score? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He scored a try as well. Yeah. Yeah, he's and then, slowly. I, th- he's, uh, I think he's slowly building into his game. You know what I mean? Like he's come back from that many injuries the last two years, and it's going to come with confidence. But what he does is when he does and in- does put himself and make himself involved in the game, he is efficient with everything he does. He's hard to handle. He's quick. He's fast. He puts himself in the picture. He still defends well. Uh, at the back of the park, he's important around, I guess, defensive reads and also numbers for the for the Melbourne Storm. Um, but he's slowly building into it. I think he'll be better for the run as he keeps on going and building more confidence in himself. And then once I guess you get someone like Cameron Munster back, then everyone they've got their their spine together. Then you're back playing the football you want to play. Yeah, and for our for our viewers. Uh, that aren't aware one of the biggest roles in a club is the head of performance now the head of performance is in charge of not just what happens on the field but the training levels the training loads, the training content injuries, rehab coming back from injuries so the head of performance um, at Melbourne he'll be very nervous about the injury toll that Pappenhausen has had and his past mm. record with injury. So, no doubt he's having an influence in how they're playing. And he'll be in Craig Bellamy's ear saying, Hey, I know you want him on the field and we need him out on the field, but is there a way that we can have him effective but also reduce that workload in order for us to keep him out there? Because they haven't had him for a whole season for a long, long time. That's what they want. That's what they'll need. You know, when they when they have them out there, they're a much better team for it. So, yeah, the head of performance, no doubt, he's having a word and he's having an influence on some of the tactics with how he's playing the game and that reduced level that you're talking about. Well, and he's got um, some more on his plate now with Nelson and also Bronson Garlic uh, getting a hamstring and back injuries, respectively. Yeah. Also, Harry Grant rested in the game, which was what brought Bronson Garlic these minutes over the past couple of weeks that he's had. Man, for the team that's had just about the worst injury luck, they are still doing so mean, as as you said before, Adam. Uh, and now they have more stuff to deal with. Well, just, it just sets up the, the culture and the systems and the structures that the Melbourne Storm do and have created over the years since the inception, um, being able to just bring and develop these players through their, their their club, but also understand what their roles are and real clear with their jobs. Um, and when they get out there, they execute it as everyone gets their job done and everyone knows what it is and knows what that looks like. And 
and for it, being able to rest players, but also being able to juggle under the stress that they've mostly been on with injuries and stuff like that, but then also not rush them back because they're panicky. They still sit at the top of the table and still getting managed to get wins with the players that they have. And the players that they're still going to feel are quality as well. It's just that when they've got these other guys that come back, it just adds to the quality that they have already. So a club that's doing some great things, but also giving opportunities at the same time through injuries and being able to create what they've been able to do. Yeah, you, they can give those opportunities because of the depth that they've got and the trust level that they have in the depth. And I talk about mm. their depth. Their New South Wales Cup team, their reserve grade at North Sydney, they're the top of the table in, in their comp as well. So what's underneath the first grade level is also performing well, which gives them the trust that they're going to come in and, and perform well. Yeah. Well, we speak about the Storm's uh, culture. I've actually got some breaking news for you guys. The Eels coach has been named. It is Jason oh. Riles is going to become wow. the Parramatta Eels head coach for the next four seasons, starting from next season. So we'll just... there. It's finally confirmed. We, we were talking about it earlier. Yeah. They finally yeah, got it I done. This is, yeah, this is, this is great news for the players in the Parramatta club and the fans. Um, now they can actually focus and move forward on where they want to go as a direction of a club. I think Jason Rowell's done his apprenticeship at Melbourne, uh, did some international rugby stuff for England, uh, went over to the Roosters, so been behind some real quality um, coaches uh, through the NRL and now gets an opportunity. I think he was most probably the one that was touted as the next prospect coming through as a coach now be because of his resume and where he's been able to coach and help coach under the coaches that he has had. So a great signing for the Parramatta I think this is a great step in the right direction. Now all the players can move forward, uh, hopefully see a bit of a reaction now that they know what's going on. They'll be told, you know, if they want it or not, uh, which then puts pressure on players to perform now. This may be a little bit of a kick up the bum, really, for some of those middle players that, hey, we can't be comfortable anymore. Uh, we've got a new coach coming in, and he may not want us here, so we're going to have to start performing. 100%. There's no excuses now. There's no excuses. And you can already see, and there's some rumblings that Wayne Bennett's already getting his fingerprints at South Sydney. No doubt Jason Rolls will be doing that. He'll be overlooking things now. Maybe having some conversations with, with players who are in discussions about contracts and things like that. But yeah, they'll have to uh, buck up their act if they want a contract now that they've got a boss. But he was always touted, as Blairy said, he's done his apprenticeship. He's been around, he's more than ready. And as I learnt when I was a coach, and as I was told, you never really know until you do it whether you're ready or not. But after what he's been through and the coaches he's been under, I dare say he is ready. And the other gentleman that was in the running, uh, Josh Hanna, he'll probably be the next one that gets the next job available because he, just like Jason Rolls, has done his apprenticeship at Origin level around grand final teams. So, yeah, some good young coaches coming through and all the best to Jason Rolls. Mm. Sweet as. There you go, Eels fans. It's finally looking maybe a bit better for you. Uh, next game up, Cowboys versus Sea Eagles at Queensland Country Bank. The second Golden Point uh, thriller from Saturday. Yeah. So, man, if you were sat on your couch for all of Saturday <laughs> night, you were having a mean time. 21-20 uh, to the Sea Eagles. Cherry Evans, his uh, seventh, yes, seventh game-winning uh, field goal of his career. What a man and what a game. Yeah, what a game this one was. Yes, Saturday was a big night for a lot of either, you know, just rugby or league fans in New Zealand, uh, especially with obviously coming off the back of it. The Warriors set up Super Saturday. They set up Super Saturday with their performance. And then I don't know if you, I would have saw this game coming uh, from the, the Cowboys and 
the Cowboys and the Seagulls. But man, through that game, there's so many different moments, so many cool little opportunities that both teams had uh, to win the games or even to put themselves in the position to go to Golden Point. It was a crazy game. Like, again, if you were a Cowboys fan and a Seagulls fan, you're sitting on the edge of your set cheering for whoever you wanted to win. Um, again, Cherry Evans shows his class, um, shows his class with everything. I think his, his first try set up for Saab and then Saab scoring a few more tries. Uh, three tries, I think he scored. Kola at the back. I think we spoke about, you know, the movement of Trevojevic being into the into the centres and Kola going to the back. We spoke about that last week, but I thought, you know, collectively those that they were quality and some quality tries scored. And then you go to the, the Cowboys and, you know, the moment for me, and it was a high-pressure moment, was Drinkwater's two-point field goal. To put him into mm. that, that to, get, to, to put him into that position, like that's a kick, that's a moment that you have to ice uh, because that's gonna either put you in the position that they did for them, or it's gonna go seven tackles and you're gonna go down the other end and the opposition scores to try and win it because you know that's what Manly Seagulls could do. But a high quality game all over the park. I thought there were some outstanding performances. Obviously, just spoke about you know. Uh, what uh, Cherry Evans done and Saab and Cola. I thought on the other side, you know, same thing with, with Drinkwater and we've always spoken about Drinkwater and what he can bring. Now, nice being quality out there as well. But again, a, a high quality game if you were both supporters of both clubs. Solid game. Yeah, that first try that uh, Cherry Evans set up was a magical ball. <laughs> yeah. I already tell him he flies out and he threads the needle for Saab yeah. to go and score. Just, I've said it before. 35 is just getting better and better. You know, just the, the old man is just, he's still got it. Just coming up with some magic plays. But Cowboys had some chances early on. There mm. was a play there with Jeremiah and then I almost could have scored himself, but passed it into Chad, Chad Townsend. He drops it over the line with yeah. it. And then he, he ends up scoring a try off a, of a, a Kyle Felt kick. And a fantastic break down the right hand side. But yeah, it was end to end stuff. That uh, drop kick from Drinkwater, I thought, was the play of the game for me. Mm. I think they go in regular time and they were down by two and tied it up and took them into Golden Point. The thing that baffled me then, after Drinkwater did that, yeah. they never went back to him. Oh, they go to Chad think? Townsend a couple of times, they give it to Valentine Holmes. You've just got a bloke who's kicked it from 42. Why did, why did he either step up or then just go looking for Drinkwater? Yeah, I thought, yeah. Uh, yeah, Willie, I think like you said, Willie, man, I thought, you know, Drinkwater was, he can kick and kick a ball, obviously. Yeah. Um, but they went back to Val Holmes and he just wasn't, he just wasn't hitting them right. Just wasn't hitting right. So you just, when you just set up for Drinkwater to have the, have the first crack, you know what I mean? But yeah. That, he had that all was, the time in the world, Val Holmes. That one that he missed, yes. He had all the time in the world. And then, you know, you Cherry Evans doesn't need any invitations. Just go down no. there, book, slot him away, win the game. Man's got ice. <laughs> Such a good game. Such a good game. Yeah, awesome. Oh, good night. Good night, Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, more than more than just a game, sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tom Travojevic back. Same sort of thing to Pappenhausen. A uh, bit of a reduced workload. Uh, only 90 metres carried from centre, but 25 tackles, zero misses, so he wasn't, they weren't giving him an easy time necessarily, but he was defensively solid. Yeah. Solid, yeah. yeah. Solid. There were still some yeah. movements that he he, he he got wrong. He's got an understanding. There was a couple of times when Brooks went in, and he's got an understanding, he's got to have, have an understanding that when his inside man goes in, he's got to come to, and he held off and he created some space that the Cowboys took control of. So just some little stuff that he's got to, he's got to learn about playing centre, some intricacies there. Yeah, definitely. And then also uh, there's some rumours swirling on Cola that he actually has a knee injury that he picked up in that game. Uh, so it seems like as soon as he's taken up the fullback mantle, he might be back out and Hopwade is going to be back in at, at fullback. Uh, which is no wonder he ran 309 metres, seven tackle breaks, one try assist, one offload. So, man, Cola at fullback. It's a shame if he is yeah. injured and is going to be out. 
he's, he's a he's a he, I think he's a support runner as a fullback carries the ball back strong but his his effectiveness is around the middle of the park so when there's a break he's that quick he can get his hand straight on the ball straight away and make those make those half breaks turn into a long distance breaks and I think that's where his strengths are yes he carries the ball back nice and hard um, but then when he gets into space and he breaks those tackles because he's a powerful runner he can execute the pass to score and that's what they did I guess that Saab tried that he scored that long distance one as well yeah, going if forward Lehigh for the Cowboys. Lehigh comes back in, that's, that's what we said. It should have been Lehigh from the start. Mm. Mm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, going forward for the Cowboys. So their past nine games at Queensland Country Bank Stadium, they've only won three. Uh, but they have been actually playing good outside of when they're at Queensland Country Bank. What do you think the Cowboys... Uh, a solidified top eight team? Um, no, I think there's. I think anyone from from that four four down can still be competing. You know what I mean? I think you know you talk about the Broncos and where they are at the moment. They, I think they're sitting at eleventh, um, so there's still a chance of getting in there. So there's the competition so tight, which is great about this competition is those guys anywhere from four down to about the fourteenth mark is the Warriors. Just, just I'm um, just giving them a little bit of hope, guys, for our Warriors fans. Just a little bit of hope that they could be they could be any chance of being in the eight. Um, that I guess the back of this the back of uh, origin will be will tell the story about which teams step up and go up another gear. Uh, that'll be the big key for most teams and the Cowboys as well, the Seagulls and the Dolphins too, who have been falling off the off the back as well. So it's a tough competition. I like it and I think this is where uh, the best teams will stand up in the next uh, you know month or fortnight. Yeah there's okay. there's a lot to be said between now and then, between the eight, and as with the Cowboys losing Murray Talangi, that could have a big effect on them. Uh, yes. Pan Pan getting Cleary back. But there's some Melbourne are picking up some more injuries. Other teams could pick up some injuries along the way. Who knows what can happen? I don't, I don't think anybody is really settled other than the top three in the eight. Yeah, I've got to keep asking the question to stir up the dramas of the top eight, you know, as, as they do on the as they do on the big screens, you know, the big media. Uh, next game, the big 307. Roosters wow. versus Dragons. Jared, what a what a send off. Oh not a send off yet, but what a <laughs> what a prop to him. His, his ten minutes send off. <laughs> you meant. Uh, yeah. But what a way to celebrate that game with a massive win, 42-12 over the Dragons. Man, the Dragons conceded over 100 points in two games to the Roosters this season. They're really just the bogey team, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, um, again, like, what a, what a record, what an achievement for a Kiwi player to play, you know, now have hold the record for the most capped rooster player ever um man he's done so much i guess for that club uh, he's done so much for new zealand but when he's represented new zealand he's done so much for the game uh, he is most probably a dying breed of enforcer in the competition um no one plays the game like he is now the way that he carries the ball the way that he defends and it was a fitting moment uh, 10 minutes on the sideline just to chill him out a little bit you, you, you couldn't have envisioned a game this big of occasion a game if without Jared sitting on the sidelines for a little bit of a stint because you knew that he was going to come out and put his body on the line or his head in the wrong position or his shoulder in someone's chin because of that's how he plays. And I think I think that, you know, that, that I saw them speak about Jared coaches as well, speak about how Jared is the toughest player that they've had in that club, but also plays the game on the edge and like I said, there, there it is a dying breed of how Jared plays. The game has changed so much to then. And, you know, credit to, to Jared and what he's done for the game, but also for the Roosters, man. And still got more games to come. He's going to be, you know, he's going to be breaking records uh, for that club. Enormous effort. Uh, great win from the Roosters. You know, Sam Walker, the Warriors just going from one 
one step to another, just doing things that not many people are doing. But quality game for the Roosters. They were strong. They were strong. They were tough. They were competitive. They had so much to play for. They wanted to get this one for Jared. Um, you know, outstanding. Dominic Young was good on the edges. What they did and what they were able to create with the players on the back of some intimidation, some energy and defensive work was outstanding. You look at the Dragons, um, you know, they're inconsistent with their performances. There's some days there where they look real good. You know, Jaden is playing well. You know, Ben Hunt's playing well. Everyone's playing well. And then they come up against, like you said, a, a team that had so much to play for and just gave them a bit of a rugby league lesson. Just put it on them from the get-go. Uh, play tough. And it's hard to see what the Dragons are. They, they sit in and around the eight as well. And uh, they just can't find consistency with their performances and how they can perform against, I guess, a team that tries to come out. And the Roosters are known to be able to bully teams because of, obviously, on the back of what Jared Jared does and how he carries himself so a team that puts it on the Dragons I feel like the Dragons try and find can't find what it is that they can get over the top of the opposition like that Yeah, huge congratulations to Jared, 307 games most capped rooster of all time at a club that was a foundation member, they were one of the original clubs in our game, so you that gives you an indication of how many players have gone through that that club. Players like Arthur Beetson, you know, some legends mm. that have been through there. And he sits at the top. He's at the top of the pile for for appearances. So, yeah, he'll forever go down in the annals of history of that club and in the game is one of the greatest to ever pull off the tricolours. Yeah, he's been a fantastic performer, a legend of a fellow, you know, so, yeah, it was great to see him go out there and play no differently to the way he's got to, to the other 306. His first first tackle of the game, mm. set the tone for it. He yeah. just went after Bully and just put him on, put it on. It was almost like he had a, a personal battle with him. He was trying to chase him when he was carrying the ball, and every time he carried it, carried it at home, he was swinging, got a swing in arms. So, yeah, probably fitting he, he hadn't got the Jared 10 minutes, <laughs> gets back on there, gets the split on the head. Bleeding, fans are loving it. Brave hearts walking yeah. off the field. Yeah, Jared's, oh, no. Jared's loving it. He's going on. <laughs> so, yeah, it was a, a real big day for him. But uh, one I think is he's really stepped up lately is Sam Walker. His kicking game for the Roosters outstanding again. Short kicking game, long kicking game, short passing game. He's uh, creating a lot of havoc for his back rowers and his centres. They had to have Tupanua. Outside of him this week, he picked up a try. So the Roosters, again, attacking-wise. Um, interesting for me, I think he's Tedesco's playing the best form that he's had for the last couple of years. And it's just yeah. a shame that he misses out. I still think, though, I still think he captains Australia and plays there at the end of the season. Oh. As crazy as that might seem, he's missing out on origin, but I still think he's the Australian fullback come the end of the season. And, you know, such as his form right now but yeah the dragons yeah disappointed and, but that's where they are they're that inconsistent team who can turn it on one week and just mm. fall off fall off the wagon the next weekend but yeah just oh no yeah oh, oh he's that, gone again he was about to say i think he was about to break some news oh he's about okay to there's, there's going to be breaking news coming out of his mouth. What's the breaking news you're about to Got say? Got some news here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you do not me. No, no, no. no. But what, what you did say about Different Tedesco. No, no. <laughs> that's not, that's not. <laughs> oh, Tedesco? Yeah, Tedesco. Um, I was just going to read out his, his stat line. The uh, one try, yep. 324 meters, one line break, mm. two try assists, 13 tackle breaks. Like, you're, you're so right, Willie. The man has been cooking for the Roosters. Um, one thing the, for, on Jared, I thought so after Satili's try, at the, right at the end of the game, he went back to the Roosters' try line and the sound of the crowd was insane oh, they were they were all i think they were chanting jared 
Jared. And it was so loud, just like off my little laptop speakers. I thought that was a pretty, pretty sweet moment. Yeah, well, fitting moments for someone that's done so much for one club, you know what I mean? And the respect that he commands on and off the field, but the, I guess, you know, the, the humble guy that he is off the field compared to what he is on the field, um, it's, it's a massive representation of what he's able to, been able to do for that club and how much the fans respect what he's done. But also the club, uh, he will go up in, on the walls in that club, people will walk in and he'll be up there with alongside some of the legends of the Roosters. So, um, you know, congrats to the big fella. Uh, he looked really good when he had the old blood coming down his face too. What a what a <laughs> what a picture that he will have there forever, eh? A moment, yeah. and to be able to go off his family and his kids. Like, you know, there's no better way to go and um, celebrate a moment like that and walk out with your family, but also see everyone. You know, have a I put in a tunnel for him and he walks out, and that's how much respect that everyone has for him. He's been able to do that, and an awesome day, awesome achievement, and you know, the bros still keep going. Um. Roosters wingers. So we did our mid-season awards predictions two weeks ago. In that time, all of a sudden, the Roosters wingers have both shot up the try scoring uh, leaderboard. So they're now second and third most. Dom Young on 13, uh, Daniel Tupo on 12. And I'm kind of feeling like we said Lofiana Tan Pereira is going to score the most tries. I'm kind of thinking maybe we should uh, revise that and it's probably going to be Dom Young. Dom Young, yeah, Dom Young. Yeah. Especially how the Roosters have been playing. Well, well, that's that's the thing, eh? The, like, the Roosters are playing a style of football where their wingers score a lot of tries. Um, the Titans rely on um, Khan Pereira to make long breaks or finish tries or kick early and those kind of things. The structure and the style of Roosters play involves the wingers scoring a lot of tries. They, they kick threats as well in the air so they kicked the both of them but also mm. you know what I mean they can score tries from far as well so yeah they maybe maybe we might revise <laughs> we got time we could do what we want <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? okay on to the last game awards. of the weekend Raiders versus Knights at GIO Stadium 16-12 to the Knights pretty hectic into that game as well a lot, of good, a lot of good games this week, but this was a, the one to end it all. Ponga back as well. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, like you said, if a great weekend of rugby league, I think uh, some great milestones. Obviously, we just spoke about it, but also some great footy played. Uh, the, the teams, and it's getting competitive. This is what it's bringing, you know what I mean? It's bringing out the best of teams. It's bringing out the best in players. Tedesco, for example, but also... Uh, you know, bringing players back from injury, Caelan Ponga and, and him for the Newcastle Knights. Again, liking the Newcastle Knights when their forwards are playing well, it allows everyone else to play their structure. The Canberra Raiders uh, are a tough team, have been a tough team this year to know what they're trying to, how they want to perform. They've had moments where they look good and tough and strong. I've always known the Raiders to be a, a tough and resilient team that they will never go away they'll keep playing to the 80th minute and you have to beat them you, they're not going to beat themselves and that's how they kind of that's the, the style of play that they play so for the teams that they play against them they need to play some football they can't just get into the grind of these guys they can start like that and then try and score some points and I think you know the Newcastle Knights got away and, and got, got the win there but the, the Raiders are still trying to find a little bit about themselves I think this year like the competition's tough and these guys you know Joseph Tarpney is just trying his best. Uh, he's a he's a world class player and he's doing his thing through the middle of the park. But he's mostly going to need some support. I like obviously we've spoken about Ko Weeks and what he's been able to do. That try that he scored was outstanding. Um, he is lightning fast. Um, you know I've seen him score some tries. I didn't know he was that quick, but he's been able to you know with their young halves they've been able to create moments of of brilliance. Uh, but it's, it hasn't been consistent enough for me. Yeah, I think Ricky Stewart will be disappointed in some of their defence and their application to defence. Some of the some of the tackling was feeble at best from the Raiders. Um, the Knights ran hard. They ran hard definitely, but yeah, they, they missed some tackles and fell off. A lot of tackles mm. where their contact was just not 
where it needed to be. So I think Ricky Stewart will be disappointed with with some of that. But yeah, great to see Caelan Ponga come back, back to his running best. Hence why his uh, his name has been mentioned again. Straight back into mm. Origin, one game on the bench. If that's the case, that'll be good. But he has given himself an opportunity. Dan Gagai was strong again. They almost had a chance if. Uh, Savage had to put the ball down in the corner yeah. to tie it up. Would have been back to extra time, another extra time game, but it wasn't to be for the Raiders. So their poor home form continues. And as Blair said, they're still on a bit of a journey of discovery to who what their identity is. You know, it's a bit of a shame to be saying that, you know, this deep into the season, but I think their plan is long term. Their plan is, is long term for the Raiders, especially with Ricky resigning yeah. and some of the young talent they've they've got coming through. But the the Knights are dangerous. The Knights are dangerous. Greg Marge is playing well again. They've uh, got themselves into ninth position, knocking knocking on the door of the eight on the equal points. But yeah, they could be another team that if, if they find some confidence, could be in the, could be there in the postseason. Well, especially yeah, Willie. I think just touching up, just before you go. Um, Ithram, just touching on Willie's point about building and I think if we're talking about um, the identity of the Canberra Raiders we can kind of already see where they're heading around obviously their two young halves and the direction of where they're trying to head I guess development and development for the future um, you know so they like you said they're, they're trying to figure out who they are as a club now and like I said earlier they have been a club that will never go away they keep turning up I think they're trying to create that with these younger players now so they're building for the future so I guess for Canberra fans is just a hold in there uh, because there is some great talent in that club as well and they do some great things already but they're inconsistent with what they're doing especially in defence um, For the Knights uh, that Ponga sort of best Mazu and then out the other way to Gagai and obviously last season it was Dom Young that was when they went on that massive winning streak it was off the back of the mm. back fives just incredible ability to attack out wide. Now that Ponga is back, Best's back from that injury he had earlier, Marzu has started picking up his form after only scoring two tries in I think the first 10 weeks. He scored three tries in the past two weeks. Yeah. And then Best obviously last week as well. Are they going to, basically, I'm asking, are they going to do the same as they did last year and make that massive run off the back of Ponga's brilliance? Well, all teams are going to want to do that, wouldn't they? All teams are going to want to do that, and, and Newcastle will want to do the same. Like you said, on the back of Caelan Ponga now being fit and healthy and back on the field, anything can change in the game of rugby league week to week, day to day. But every club will be looking to try and get on a run now. Um, and I said how important the time after Origin will be for every club, is because there's nothing else in between there from now, from then until finals, until the top eight is decided. So every team will want to go on the run, and no, no different to the Newcastle Knights. Uh, guys are finding form, like you said, Greg Marsh is finding form. Their back five are finding form. Gag guys getting back into his best. Hence why they're both being selected, him and Ponga, for for hopefully you know ends for the Queensland team. So. You know, they'll, they'll want to go on a run. Uh, and some of the guys that took them on that run last year are finding their form now and, and playing some really good footy. What they haven't had this year with the Knights and what I think they need to find if they're going to go on this run is a settled halves combination. Mm. They've had Gamble, they've had Cogger, they've had Hastings. Now they've got Hastings and Will Price, who seems to be clicking. These two have had two pretty good games together. If they can gel and they can have a partnership that stays together for a little while, then I think those two can help Ponga be even more effective and help them go on some sort of a run that you're talking about they went on last year. They can't just rely on Ponga. He can't do it all on his own. He'll come up with some magic. But unless yeah. they find a combination in six and seven, that allows them to get that space, allows them to get clean ball to help those edges look dangerous, then they could struggle. But yeah, they, they've got to do that first, find out who, what halves combination is best for them. Um, Tyson Frizzell played his 250th game. 
Yeah, it's great. Um, another guy that's been in the obviously the NRL for a long time and is a quality player at that. Um, a representative player, international level, uh, strong carrier, confidence. I guess confidence when he's on your t- on your side when he's your back row as a half. Like he works hard, he runs really good lines. Uh, 250 games is no easy feat. You know, we're talking about guys playing 300 or even you know debuting games. Like it's just as special as your first game as as your 250th. And it's a credit to him and what he's been able to do through his career. And he cr- keeps on and creating more opportunities for himself further on. So a massive congratulations. Congrats for Tyson. Yeah, what, what an achievement. You know, we're talking about Jared, 307, even 250. Fantastic. <coughs> he's he's not the biggest forward in the game, mm. but he plays all heart. He's all effort. And you've seen, you look back at his highlight reel and some of the stuff he's done at Origin, chasing wingers down. And mm. He just up on any play, which is why teams love him and why he's got the 250 game. So, yeah. Hopefully, in the next couple of years, he gets his uh, 300. Mm. Uh, one more thing on this game. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, Enari Tuala, he's torn his calf. Uh, who do you guys think will be the replacement? So he's on the right wing. It could be Tom Jenkins, maybe uh, Fletcher Sharp, or maybe could David Armstrong before he leaves at the end of the season, could he come back into the team? Um, I think they'll go with Fletcher Sharp. I think, I think he's a quality. I think he's a quality player. He he need. I think we've seen what he's been able to create from the fullback. So he's more of a runner, more of a runner. But you add <coughs> him and Kalen to the back for, back three. He's obviously not a bigger body, but he can still work really hard under with his quick feet and, and challenging the defensive line every time he carries the ball. So uh, my pick would be Fletcher Sharp. I like what he brings. Uh, and again, I've said it before, I think he, he reminds me of uh, Ryan Pappenhaus and the way he runs and the way he carries himself and he's hard to handle and, and he hasn't let the Newcastle team down as of late. Yeah, well, I'm Fletcher Sharp. Okay, cool. Well, before we go off, I was a bit padding out the runtime in that game at the end because I was waiting for the Queensland squad announcement, which it has finally come out. Oh, and wow. well, fitting we talk about some nights in the last game because I'll read the squad out to you now. So from starting from up the top, Reese Walsh, Selwyn Cobo, Dane Gagai, Hammer, Val Holmes, Tom Dearden, Cherry Evans, Ruben Cotter. Ben Hunt, Lindsay Collins, Kurt Capewell, Jeremiah Nanai, uh, Pat Carrigan, Harry Grant, Mo Fotueka, Kalfusi, and Ponga at 17. <laughs> With uh, Reed Marnie at 20. <laughs> <laughs> That's, hey, I had a big smile on my face when I was looking at the line and I was like waiting for Reed's name on the bottom. <laughs> Put him in there, get him in there, give him a taste of <laughs> Give him taste of the Queenslanders. Uh, yeah, um, a, quali- a quality side, I think. Uh, Dane Gag, obviously, leadership. Um, Hammer in the centres, obviously, his shoulders okay, those kind of things. But I think, um, you know, it's going to be a tough game. Trent Liero gets an opportunity. He, he gets, no, he doesn't get it. He's an 18th man. Trent Liero, Liero is 18th man. But Caelan Pong on the bench, again, if you look at the bench, how it's going to be. This is going to be a fiery game, I think. You know, Queensland up against it. Both teams, it's it's a decider. If you look at the the two teams, especially the bench, there's a massive difference around where we know and where what we've seen of the last game, where the Newcastle or where the New South Wales team's going to go. It's going to be a power game. They're going to create momentum through the forwards, and then on the back of that, the kicking game of Mitch Moses is going to be high quality. So. They're going to try and replicate replicate the same game style and play that they beat them in, in game two, and go up to Queensland and try to do the same thing. Queensland, they're going to they're going to be up against it. I, I think you know when you look at their forwards, they're going to have to stand up and go toe to toe with some of the big big forwards in the New South Wales pack team. And then on the back of that, the benches are going to have to come on and and face some of the bigger boys as well, Spencer Lee New and Mitch Barnett. So a competitive team, uh, man. This is a hard one. This is a hard one. Does that mean Jaden Saw has been suspended? Uh, he's been dropped. It's a flat drop. Been dropped. Wow. Ooh, he's well. been left, left out of the team, okay? 
Yeah, big well, call. you know, Billy Slayer makes some big calls, doesn't he? He, he normally picks and sticks, and he's not afraid to make these calls too, will he? So, um, you know, no. it's a big, big omission from him. Yeah, well, we've been screaming for Dane Gagai to get in there. He gets his chance again. He was 18th man last last Origin game. Um, interesting that he goes straight into the centres. I know he's been playing centre there for the Knights, but played his majority of Origin career at wing. And they shift mm. Valentine Holmes out, out to the wing. And the, whether they swap those two over come game time, I'm not too sure. But they're both experienced. I'm just happy to see... Uh, Gagai and Cobo back in there, those power carrying backs that can get, help get get us out of the backfield, get us on a roll on. Uh, but yeah, a good side, very good side. I think Kalfusi's played a, a couple of games at middle this year. He's been pushed up in the absence of Jesse Bromwich. He's played, played middle for the Dolphins, so yeah, he can come on and cover that spot. But big job for uh, Mo Fotoweka coming off the bench yeah, as the, the sole middle on that bench, big, big job for him. We've got some pace, got some uh, ability there. You know, only a couple of seasons ago, Colin uh, Ponga came on and played 13. He did a yeah. really good job. He busted a busted New South Wales open through the middle with one of his carries. So, yeah, whether that's a ploy that Billy Slater's looking at too, possibly. Yeah, I, I think so, Willie. I think you know why. This, I don't see him sitting at the back or in those other positions unless someone gets injured. So I think he falls straight into that that 13 or that 14 role where he gets on. Oh, well, he's playing, what numbers he there? He's playing 17, but I think he'll be in the middle of the park. He'll play some shape off him. When those bigger middles get tired, yeah. hopefully the, the position is 50-50. That's when he's going to come into his own. If they've got no, if they don't have position or they don't have field position, Willie, it's going to be real. I think it's going to be a real tough night for the Queens. And there's a very small bench forwards. Mo, Fotoika and Kafusi have a massive day, like you said, to go up against some of these bigger guys. And then they've got Harry Grant and, and Caelan Ponga to try and dig him off out of their 20 metre line on the back of some really good kicking from Mitch Moses. So a big, big day for those bench boys. Um, if, the, if the game's 50-50 position and they're completing high both teams, I think the Queensland team will, will come away with this one for sure. It seemed like a lot of fans were uh, calling for David Fafita, obviously. Uh, I wonder what's going to be the talk now that Sua did get dropped and it wasn't Fafita coming in to replace him. Yeah, well, it's everyone's been calling for Fafita, eh? And I don't like, again, like you said, Willie, he's done nothing wrong. He's tried his best. I'm guessing, you know, I, I don't know what Billy Slater is thinking, uh, whether he, he's got some little things or whether the game, he's going for more leadership and guys that have played bigger games, are more more games at that higher level. I don't know. I think for feeders, a game, a game breaking forward that could come off the bench and add value. Uh, but he's going for, I guess, someone like Caelan Ponga who can still carve up the middle of the park if they want to spread the ball but the whole thing for me and I just said it before is the game has to be 50-50 um, share of position if it's not 50-50 share of position the team that has more position is going to win the game hands down uh, with the back of New South Wales and their kicking but also if you know Queensland have it I think they've got the strike power anytime they get inside their 50 and we've seen they can score points they've got players there that can score points so 50-50 share of possession is going to be the key uh, for both teams to try and win it if they, both teams get it it'll be a great game yeah it's, uh, it is a bit of a shock for Fida especially when they dropped Jaden Sewer they've gone with a lighter bench but yeah, that's his call. He's he's obviously seen something, and no doubt today, I dare say, he'll be asked the question, what Fafita has to do, and we'll find out an answer from Billy Slater as to why he's left him out of the squad again. Someone who I would have liked to have seen at some stage in, in this origin, and he was in the squad for Origin 1, but didn't get on, uh, was Ezra Mann. Would have liked to yeah. see him get a chance at some stage. And I think he could be uh, a real X-factor for Queensland, especially in the absence of uh, Cameron Munster. Yeah, and last one before we head off. Uh, obviously, you heard me shout his name because as much as I am New South all day, I do love Reed Marnie. 
Um, he's obviously at 20th man because Harry Grant's been dealing with this longer term injury. Okay. I actually think maybe they just he's give Harry Grant the rest, bring Reed Marnie in because you know what he's going to do. Even if it's a tough game, he's still going to be like that the whole game. And that would make a really entertaining game, I feel like. <laughs> he, he he would get amongst it, that's for sure. There's no doubt. Um, he's tough anyway when it comes to playing the game. He's mostly built for, you know, origin, although he's a little bit of a smaller body. He doesn't, he's not afraid to get stuck in and, and tackle. Uh, again, obviously 70 tackles on the weekend, and he'll just be making those more as well. So I think, yeah, if Harry Grant is, is not 100%, you, you'd play Reid any day of the week and get the grub in there to try and spice it up a bit, <laughs> will he? Eh? Yeah, and it, it'd be a little bit hypocritical for mine if he is a, carrying some niggles, Harry Grant, because he hasn't set the world on fire for Melbourne this year. And I'm not ever questioning his ability and how dangerous he can be for Queensland. But if he dropped Cobo and left him out of game two because he had some niggling injuries, he had some things that he wanted to go away and work on, but yet he brings somebody else in who's not 100%, I think that's a little bit hypocritical. Do you know what I'm getting at? Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I bring him in. He's not got Reed Marty there. Just keep Reed Marty there. Just name well, him. Well, the whole thing. But, yeah, the whole thing. The whole thing with Origin, Willie, and especially the good thing about uh, Queensland is everyone hits the ground running. You know what I mean? There's there's no questions around who's injured or uh, what's he carrying because it takes the focus away from the football side of things. Yeah. Eh? We've never heard a, a, a Queensland team talk about someone being injured going into camp. Everyone's been yeah. healthy. And, and you spoke about Cobo's last one. Billy Slater said exactly the same thing, um, that, you know, like he had obviously some, he, he's, he's tired, he's carrying some injuries and stuff like that, wanted to give him a rest. If the Broncos weren't playing, he wasn't going to be playing anyway. So I think uh, that's the thing is you go and focus. Um, same thing as what New South Wales did last game. No one was injured. Everyone was on the field, training pitch, yep. day one. You're getting stuck into each other, and that's how it is, and that's what Orange is about. You can take away all the excuses, turn up and train well, because this is a decider. You have to win it. Like There's nothing here. Yep. So on the flip side to what I'm saying, if he's fit, perfect, boom, gone. Yep. Let's go hit the ground running and be ready. Red Marnie, you've been mentioned around the Queensland team, come into camp, get, some, get a feel for it, <clears throat> get an understanding yep. of what it's like to be around Origin camp, because you could be a good chance in the future. So, yeah, that, that'd be yes. perfect if, it's that, if that's the case. Yeah, awesome. So, Up the blues. <laughs> Up the Queenslanders. Shot, boys. <laughs> oh, well, Dills, it's like, good to I... see you, brother. <laughs> yeah, I thought I'd just pop, <laughs> pop in at the end, you know, wrap things up. I was going to ask you, from, yeah. are you a little bit disappointed that Reed is a Queenslander and not a New South rep? Uh, nah, because, you, you yeah. know what, I... I I would like again. I love playing with people like that. I think you know what I mean. It's it's annoying when you play against someone like that. I guess it'd be same as like Jared. You know what I mean? Like everyone hates playing against Jared, but when you're on their side, it's a different story. Like it's it's that they they are competitors, and that's what hold that's what makes them different. Is they compete for everything, and they put themselves on the firing line week in week out. You know what I mean? So I love that he's a Queenslander too. It makes it more fun. How good. I think it's I think it's like um, for you guys looking at New South players like you pro- you guys probably all love Latrell right even though yeah. he's New uh, South yeah yeah so yeah, exactly yeah. it's the same for me with Reid Marnie yeah, yeah, as much yeah. as he's Queensland he's still he's still a human you know mm-hmm. and he's the man <laughs> 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 <This guy. laughs> oh, well, all right should we do a wrap up wrap this up yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone, again. A beautiful game of rugby league. Bring into your eyes and ears all the way globally, Samoa, here in Bali, <laughs> and our man, William Whangare. Make sure you guys tune into our, <laughs> our social, on all our social platforms, our YouTube channel, Run Australia, our social media, Instagram, TikTok, everything. Thank you so much for listening, and that's us again for another great episode of Rugby League.